one will it advance the Probably not. not okay I will stand here then uh, this that's the uh, last turn. okay well I will just be presenting from here then I won't block anybody sure <laughs> all right so as mentioned I'm gonna cover uh, information about oak wilt, uh, how to identify it, how to manage it, and then at the end I will provide some specific information as it uh, pertains to Wood Creek uh, particularly. So, uh, okay. So uh, to begin at the beginning, uh, oak wilt is a fungus. Uh, specifically, it's something called Brettsiella phagacea. It is a primary vascular pathogen or disease of oak trees. And what we mean by vascular pathogen is it works by invading the water conducting vessels of the tree, what we'll call xylem. And we, what we say primary, what we're typically meaning is that it is something that can affect um, even healthy trees. With a lot of times with tree diseases, we think about things that are really affecting trees that are already sick or declining. Oak wilt can affect healthy trees, which is important to remember. And the tree actually responds by plugging up that water conducting tissue uh, as, as a response to recognizing the oak wilt within it. And that results in a lack of water to the tree and typically a death by dehydration. So when we talk about oak wilt, what we're really talking about is uh, the tree cutting off its own water supply to try to defend itself causing the symptoms of disease. Why it's important uh, is uh, 
a lot of y'all have probably seen it by now, why it's important. It's affected thousands of acres throughout central and west Texas. Uh, and that, of course, has an impact since we've got so many oaks on beauty, uh, wildlife, habitat, shade for our houses. It also has an effect on bottom line. They've done studies in the past, actually in the Austin area, found that uh, the value of trees on a residential lot could account for about 15 to 20 percent of the lot's overall value. Where Oakland exists uh, within the United States, this map surprises people a lot of times because they think it's only a, a Texas problem. It's not. Uh, you do see we've got a lot of it in central Texas. Uh, however, it stretches up through uh, the uh, Ozarks into the Lake States over to the Appalachian area. So it's really kind of more a, a Midwestern, uh, Middle American kind of issue is where we see most of it. In Texas, uh, you can see that's a map of 2019 counties with it known to occur. And it mainly follows this area that we would consider to be central Texas, really the I-35 corridor and west where we've got such abundant oak forests. Um, it, uh, to be on that map, we have to have gone out and confirmed it in the field as well as isolated, isolated it in the laboratory from those counties. And I do think we've added one or two in South Texas since 2019. It was first detected in the state in 1961. Uh, however, we didn't really realize how pervasive it was until probably about 19. And that's the point when we started catching on that a lot of the issues that we've been calling for a long time, oak decline, or just said, oh, oaks just die. We started to put two and two together and realized it was actually because of this farm. Uh, likely, um, there, there are accounts of oak wilt, uh, what we would probably believe to be oak wilt well into the, the 30s and 20s, and, and, and likely before. So what trees are susceptible to infection by oak wilt? And the answer is oak trees. Uh, if it's not an oak tree, it can't get oak wilt. If it is an oak, oak tree, it can potentially get oak wilt. However, all oak trees are not created equal. Uh, when we talk about oak trees, we oftentimes break them into groups. And there are three groups of oak trees rec uh, um, represented here in the Wood Creek area. And they would be red oaks, white oaks, and live oaks. So red oak trees are, are oftentimes we might just refer to them as red oak trees, but there are a couple different species like Texas or Spanish oak, humard oak, blackjack oaks, all examples you might have around here. They are extremely susceptible to oak wilt. If they get oak wilt, they will die and they will die quickly. They also play a really important role in spreading the fungus we'll talk about in a minute. White oaks uh, are things like post oaks, uh, shin oaks, uh, monterey oak, chinquapin oak, fir oak, they carry some varying levels of resistance. Um, however, it is important to point out they are not immune. Sometimes people are selling trees out there saying, you know, the, the Mexican oak will not get oak wilt. Not, that is false. They are not immune to oak wilt. And then live oaks, those are our most common oak trees, the ones with the, the kind of green leathery leaves that re remain on the tree through uh, the winter or lost in the early spring. Uh, they are in an intermediate in their susceptibility to the fungus. Uh, they do not always die from disease. However, it's where we typically see the largest problem because of a vast interconnected root system with our live oak trees. And again, we'll talk about spread in a minute, but because these live oak trees are all connected, we see movement over vast areas. And this is just to illustrate the point there. You've got a, a live oak tree on the right-hand side with a thinning poor looking canopy. On the left-hand side of the screen, there's a post oak in the white oak group that looks uh, as happy as can be. When we talk about transmission of oak wilt, uh, it's important to keep in mind that there are really two different methods of transmission that occur. Uh, one has to occur before the other can occur, usually. And so what I mean by that is there's this above-ground and below-ground spread. So to begin with, with this above-ground spread method, you have to have an infected red oak tree at a very certain time of year. Usually, uh, it'll be infected in the late fall or early winter, and it forms what's called a fungal mat in the, the late winter or early spring. And that fungal mat is uh, it's the fruiting body of the fungus itself. It makes the spores. Spores are how fungus is spread. And so th that fungal mat is formed underneath the bark of a dying red oak tree, only a red oak tree. 
There are certain insects out there. They're sap-feeding beetles. Um, they're, they're generalist insects that eat all kinds of sugary things called nitty doolip beetles. Very, very small. You can see two there right below a dime uh, in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. They're out looking for sweet things in the early spring. This fungus emits a very sweet odor, kind of like a rotting or decaying fruit. It attracts the beetle in. They eat the fungus, get spores on their body, and then fly out looking for other meals. Something else that uh, makes a sweet odor is sap from fresh uh, cut wounds or fresh wounds on other trees. And so if this um, order of events occurs in just the right order, you have the possibility of this insect transporting the fungus from an infected red oak tree to a healthy oak tree. And so that's the above ground spread. It's not very common, but it happens just enough that we do have a problem with oak wilt. Now, once we have, nope, there we go. Once we have an infected tree, we also have the potential for below ground or root to root spread. This happens because, as I mentioned earlier, many of our oak trees have an interconnected root system. And that can either happen because the oaks have originated as a clonal group. One acorn dropped, a tree grew, its uh, uh, siblings or, or clones of itself really grew out from the root system, and so it's actually one big tree. Or you can have multiple trees connect their root system. So an acorn dropped, a tree grew, another tree grew, and they grew their root system together. Through that interconnected root system, this fungus is able to essentially travel tree to tree, spreading up to 50 to 75 feet per year. So whenever we talk about oak wilt issues, uh, you know, and we say, oh, it's, it's spreading down the street, you know, my neighbor had it and my other neighbor has it, we're talking about this root spread. That, that is the mechanism that we're most concerned about here. Looking at how to identify uh, oak wilt, again, with live oaks being our most uh, our most common issue. The handy thing is it does put on some pretty characteristic symptoms usually within the leaves. So in live oaks, we're looking for rapid defoliation, uh, very often a death within three to six months. Uh, we are looking for almost always a spread to adjacent trees through that root system. It does not form those fungal mats, so that's not something we need to worry about. The uh, figure given up there is about five to 15 percent survival rate naturally on those live oak trees. I venture that it's usually a little bit higher than that even, but when I talk about survival, I think about trees that are uh, have lost a lot of their limbs or lost a lot of their canopy cover. They're still putting out leaves, they're still alive, but they're not the beautiful tree they are. And we see leaf symptoms. Uh, the main one that we look for, because it's, it's fairly diagnostic, there's not much else that causes uh, this really distinct pattern it's called venal necrosis, which is what you see there on the screen kind of the, uh, the dead Christmas tree or herringbone, however you want to look at the, um, the, the veins essentially of that leaf turning brown color. Some other things we would see are uh, tip burn or marginal necrosis. That's on the left-hand side of the screen there, essentially where the leaf tip is turning brown, edges turning brown. Very often, you'll also see a bit of that venal necrosis along that, what we would call the midrib, that central axis of the leaf. You see some of those are a little brown there. Again, the venal necrosis in the center, and then on the right-hand side, actually kind of in the exact opposite, where the veins are remaining green, but it's turning kind of a yellowish, limish color between the veins. We call that vein banding sometimes. <clears throat> oak wilt in red oaks uh, is, is challenging because it oftentimes does not take on very distinctive symptoms, and we see death in red oak trees uh, pretty often for a lot of different reasons. There are a lot of red oak trees dying from drought. But what we often see with them, uh, they very often will maintain their leaves and then just rapidly drop them. Uh, we see flagging. Uh, in other words, it's, it's the big picture there on the top right corner of the screen where the tree is mostly green, but you can see one branch is turning brown. And then that kind of progresses through the tree. You'll see another branch turn brown. Um, and usually we'll see this progress over the course of about four to six. And again, that's from a healthy tree to a dead tree because this is fatal on red oak trees, 100%, no, more, no survivors. We do have that possible formation of fungal mats, as we mentioned, but again, that's only going to happen uh, typically in the uh, winter to early springtime. 
one of the only real symptoms we see on the leaves is something called bronzing, which is in that bottom right picture. It's kind of just this dull luster, the leaf is the best way I can describe it. A little more information about those fungal mats forming on these red oak trees. Uh, again, only on red oak trees. They form underneath the bark. Uh, there can be multiple mats per tree. In fact, uh, a large tree will have dozens of these uh, fungal mats on it. Uh, they produce a sweet odor. Again, that's attracting in these insects. It's, it's sometimes likened to like a, an overripe cantaloupe. Um, some people say kind of wine or beer. I, I think it's a little fruitier than that. Uh, and this is going to be typically trees infected in the late fall, early winter. Um, we'll start forming them in the late winter, early spring. And uh, that, of course, is a problem because in the early spring, that's when we have a lot of insects moving around. That's when those uh, the vector and nitty beetles act. So uh, an experienced professional can usually look at, especially with live oaks uh, in the field and be able to form a field diagnosis, looking at um, both the pattern of mortality of the trees, how disease appears to be spreading tree to tree, as well as looking for samples. However, there is laboratory verification that's possible um, by uh, chopping off physical pieces of wood, sending it into a laboratory. Uh, there is a video available that can show you how that works and I'll, I'll show you the link to that here in a second on the website where you can find more information. Uh, I, I choose to send samples off to the uh, Texas uh, Plant Disease Diagnostic Laboratory of Texas a I think they do a good job at looking at those samples. One thing to keep in mind with samples, uh, there is, uh, with this method of sampling, the possibility sometimes for a false negative, mm -hmm. meaning you do have oak wilt, but you're not detecting it within the tree. And that is especially common during extremely hot periods of time because oak wilt is actually a very heat sensitive fungus. So after watching this presentation, I would not recommend going out and sampling for oak wilt because it would not give you a positive result even if it's there. Because it is very hot right now. So now we've talked about oak wilt, what it is, let's talk a little bit about how we go about managing it. Um, quote there, there is no cure for oak wilt. Is unfortunate, uh, but there are management options, and through proper management, we can significantly reduce the loss of trees. So, we look at really a four pronged approach to management. Uh, the first one being prevention, which is the most important, uh, following by planting a diversity of trees, trenching, and fungicide injections, which are management options we'll go to in uh, some detail. So, what prevention looks like. And the main thing that we really harp on, and most of y'all have probably heard, goes back to pruning. So we talked about how the beetles are spreading around spores during uh, the springtime. And for that reason, uh, we make the recommendation that you do not prune on oak trees from Fre February 1st through June 30th, that window of the springtime. Um, with the caveat, of course, always, if there's an immediate safety concern, a reason that branch needs to be removed, uh, I would recommend mitigating a safety concern and uh, rather than uh, letting that be a hazard. Regardless of season, I would always recommend painting oak wood. Um, the sooner you can paint it after being cut, the better. And again, we're only talking about oak wounds here. Trees, uh, wounds to Elms and cedars and other trees don't need to be painted. It's, it's just to prevent that sap beetle from detecting the odor of that wound, as well as creating a small barrier to try to keep those spores from crossing. It doesn't have to be a special pruning sealant. Uh, really, any any kind of spray paint uh, from the hardware store should be equally effective. And you want to do it as soon as possible. Uh, after about three days, the window has passed, the tree is starting to naturally stop sap flow to the area. And so three to four days after the wound is usually not necessary, but try to get it on there as quick as possible. And I would say any size wound um, is a question I, I get a lot. If, if you have the ability to paint it, I sure would. Um, the, the general recommendation is about the size, but I would say if, if you make a cut and you have the capability to paint it, why not control it? Um, with firewood, uh, 
specifically red oak firewood, again, because of that fungal mat formation. If we have a dead red oak tree that we believe died from oak wilt, we would like to see that destroyed as quickly as possible. And when I say destroy, I mean burning it, burying it, or chipping it. If at all possible, do not store diseased or suspected to be diseased red oak firewood. If for whatever reason you have to keep it, you, you know, can't get someone with a big enough chipper to get rid of it or whatever. Uh, the recommended method is in the illustration there on the right hand side where firewood has been, the, the tree's been cut into chunks and stacked, and then a clear plastic part is spread over that wood, and all the edges are buried. So the insects can't get in, and it's also going to get incredibly hot underneath that clear plastic part, which is going to help kill them. For non-red oak firewood, so we're talking about white oak trees and live oak trees, uh, in terms of oak wilt spread, they're really not important. But some general best practices uh, for firewood, regardless of the tree, would be to leave it on site for about a year to let it dry out or burning it or moving it. Um, it's not going to burn very well if it's not dry for a year anyway. And there are a whole bunch of other insect things that we probably don't want to be moving around. So that's that's the really the main takeaway on a live oak and white oak uh, wood. It is safe to burn. I get that question a lot. Too. So step two would be diversifying the landscape. I liken this to uh, diversifying your financial portfolio, not putting all your eggs in one basket. However, you want to look at it. All you have is one species of tree. Um, there's something out there that can kill almost every species of tree. But there's very little that can kill multiple different species. So if you have multiple different species, um, your outlook is pretty good. Uh, that if something happens, you'll still have some tree. It's also good for the environment, but it adds beauty, all that kind of thing. So uh, now uh, is not a good time to plant trees. I would recommend planting trees in the uh, late fall to early winter. And in times, of course, when we have to get rain. Uh, generally, that's not summer in Texas. Summer is a stressful time to plant trees in Texas. Pick a tree that's a suitable size and shape for the available space. Try to avoid wounding it when you do plant it. A resource for um, learning about tree planting and looking up uh, or maybe researching potential species can be found on texasoakwalt.org. And I want, uh, if you'll take away something from this meeting, I want y'all to take away texasoakwalt.org. That is a website that is run by the Texas a and Forest Service. Uh, the information on there is good. It knows more than I do. Um, and so definitely something to take a look at if you do have any questions. But in terms of planting trees, if you look there, there's a resources tab across the top. If you click that down, there is a link to uh, something called texastreeplanting.tamu.edu. I believe. I always forget the name of it, so it's just easier to follow the link there. But they've got really good information on planting trees and selecting trees for your site. So we've worked at prevention, we've worked at diversification. What to do now if we have actually got an overall infection? Uh, the only method reader I have right now that can potentially stop that root to root transmission is physical friction. When I say physical trenching, I mean actually digging a trench into the ground is going to cut and break that root system so that the fungus can't spread root to root. When we look at placing a trench line, what we're usually looking at doing, the specifications we recommend is going out 100 feet from our last diseased tree. And that's illustrated here where we've got a diseased tree in the middle, we've got some healthy trees. We wanna go out 100 feet away from that and dig to a minimum depth of four feet. Uh, and so, of course, there is uh, essentially a zone in there where there are seemingly healthy trees that are being left out of that trench. A reason being, we can see symptoms in trees, but we don't always know how far it's traveled below the ground. And so we would like to see trees that look healthy to key us in and say, yeah, uh, 100 feet out, we should be catching all the disease. But the last thing we want to do is place a trench and realize that actually the fungus was already outside that trench line, and then it's all been there. So placing the trench uh, 100 feet away, four feet deep, it has to sever all root connection to be effective. So if we have a root running below four feet deep, and our trench is only four feet deep, 
we do have a possibility of that opal compared to blue. Which is why I would say the deeper we can do it, the better. If you've got very deep soils, which most of us don't, you may need to go further than four feet. A little more on that. Um, you can see methods of trenching there on the right hand side of the screen. Most trenching in the Texas Hill Country is performed with a rotary rock saw because that's the only way we can trench in most places around here. Mm -hmm. uh, it can cut through absolute solid limestone. And you can see in that picture there with pulling up the white powder, you can tell that's probably um, a lot of limestone there. So in these pictures, the trench is being left open. Uh, you, uh, the trench is then filled in. So a lot of people say, is that, is that opening there forever? And the answer is no. As soon as the trench is dug, it's then filled in. Uh, trench uh, equipment choice varies. Again, rock saw for most of our area. If we do have deeper, richer soils, you might be able to get in with an excavator or backhoe, which if you are in those soils might be beneficial because you can get deeper where there could be more roots in those kind of environments. Um, one thing, it's not on this screen, but effectiveness. Uh, trenches, uh, by our calculations, are about 70% effective. And that's going in at a period about five years after the trench was installed and monitoring. Uh, reasons trenches might fail, I hit on two of them already. It was incorrectly placed. It was already outside the trench line. Roots were deeper than that trench line, or potentially if enough time goes by between the, uh, the trench being installed and the fungus finally getting to that trench, we might have roots back to it. And so if we're looking at a period down the road of somewhere in the five to 10 year range, that's where I start to worry if the oak wilt hasn't gone all the way to the trench line yet. One thing in there with trenching, the ideal situation, I would like to see uh, trees within that trench line, within the diseased area, removed, and I would I would actually like to see them either pulled up or pushed over with a bulldozer. Um, that way you are removing all that host material, interrupting more root zones, uh, understanding that in a, a neighborhood setting like Wood Creek, that's not really feasible or practical. But on ranch land, that is exactly what I would like to see happen. So the next method, fungicide injection. Um, can be highly effective at keeping individual trees alive. The thing I want you to remember here is that fungicide injections do not form a barrier to spread. If uh, you have a diseased tree and you inject the healthy tree next to it, the tree further down the line can still get open. It is not forming a barrier within the root system. All it's doing is keeping individual trees alive. But in a residential setting like Wood Creek, that's highly important, of course. So when we look at fungicide injections, we're looking at typically at candidates within 100, 150 feet away from the current infection area. Reason being, uh, these fungicide injections do have a lifespan. They're only good within the tree for a period of about two years. The oak wilt can spread a maximum of about 75 feet. So if you do the math, if you're injecting any further out than 150 feet, you're wasting your money. So we want to target it so that we're getting, ideally, in front of the Oakwood Center, injecting healthy trees would be ideal because it is more effective as a prophylactic in those healthy trees. You can inject sick trees. However, they can't be too far along. So we're looking for no more than 30% chance of loss on sick life. If, if the tree is already bare, the fungicide is going to be here. And in fact, it, it, it likely will not take up the fungicide because the way trees move fluids within them is they rely on those leaves to help pull water up from the ground, carry it to the stem. And so we're using that natural system to help carry that fungicide into the side of that tree. So how that's done, um, you can see some pictures there of the, well, what's really the main method of fungicide injection, something we call macro injection into the root flare. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But we're using uh, fungicides uh, typically in the triazol family. The, the fungicide that you'll hear mentioned the most is something called propitonazole. And very often you, you hear a specific trade name called Alamo. Alamo 
uh, was kind of the pioneering product in this. Since they did a lot of the research showing the effectiveness, it, it's gone off path. So there are a lot of uh, other brands creating that same or a similar formulation. Injection methods vary. Uh, what we typically still point to is something called macro injection into the root layer, which is what's seen there where we are exposing that, uh, that top layer of roots just below where the trunk meets the ground. We're exposing that, and we are going around and physically drilling holes into the base of the trunk there and those roots. A plastic plug is then inserted into those holes, which is connected by tubing to pressurized tanks of the fungicide. The fungicide then enters the tree and uh, is pressurized, so it enters it, it's forced in a little bit, but it's mainly being sucked in by the tree. There are some different methods of doing fungicide injections. There are some DIY products out there as well. Uh, what I'll say is uh, the research that's been done has largely supported this macro injection method. I see very good results with it, uh, but there are some new products out there. There are products coming out every day and so uh, there, there are other alternatives to this exposing the root flare and using these, these large injectors. Um, effectiveness of this, about 80% in, in keeping uh, a live oak tree healthy and alive. So again, this is a, a very effective method, especially for a homeowner where your immediate impact is probably going to be your property, you know, thinking about how you're gonna protect your trees, uh, this is generally the, the desired method in, in rural, or, or I'm sorry, in, in residential and civil settings, is, is using fungicide injections to manage the spread. Again, can't emphasize enough, it is not stopping them. Uh, it is still moving. The fact that you're using fungicides probably won't keep your neighbor from getting oak wilt. And if your neighbor didn't use fungicides and you got oak wilt, um, it's not there because they didn't use fungicides, even if they had. It's still going to spread. So that's something people ask me about a lot too. Uh, you can learn a lot about fungicide injections. Again, on that TexasOakWorld.org website, there is a media tab. Under that media tab, there is a very detailed video about how fungicide injections are done. As I mentioned earlier, there's a nice detailed video about how samples are taken. There are a few other, there's a video on planting trees, and I think there's an older video, it's not quite as good, but there is an older video that talks a bit about this. Uh, and again, that is Texas Oakwood. So how you can help. Starting point is, of course, prevention. Do not prune your oak trees February 1st through June 30th unless there's immediate safety concern. And always, regardless of time of year, paint wounds to oak trees. Don't bring in firewood from unknown sources onto your property, uh, especially I would say we're really worried about bringing in red oak firewood that might have those fungal mats, or maybe even is carrying the nitty or beetle that has the forest. Talk with your neighbors about oak wilt prevention and management. Uh, it is not something that you want to be blindsided by. It is something that is present in the neighborhood, which will talk about here in just a second. And so it's something that I would say, don't be embarrassed about. If you know you have oak wilt and you're treating your trees, please let your neighbors know. Because in a year, it's probably gonna be on their property and you would have liked to know before it got to your property. So absolutely, please communicate about this. For folks that couldn't be here, there are brochures, please spread the word. We've got a lot of people moving into the area. A lot of folks that have never heard of oak wilt uh, we did a really, really great job of messaging this back in the probably 90s. A lot of y'all probably remember that, but the turnover in this area has been phenomenal since then. So there are a lot of folks that don't know. If we are seeing oak wilt problems, a few things you can talk to do. Talk to your community leaders, see the city officials. They're all sitting right here. You can talk to me. Uh, I cover the uh, Hayes and Travis County areas. However, I am local, so I know a lot about uh, this area here and the specific issues here. Uh, and uh, you can always, of course, contact professionals, private professionals to look at the trees and perform treatments. When you contact private professionals for these services, uh, we'd like to see, I can't make any recommendations, but we'd like to see certified arborists use 
because that shows at least a level of knowledge and experience they've taken a test at some point in time to show they know something. Uh, you can find contact information for vendors at kepthisoakworld.org. You can also find my contact information. I'm going to share that uh, on the very last slide here. Now, I'm about to put up a slide, but before I do, I want to explain what you're going to see, because when I put up the slide, people usually stop listening. Mm -hmm. So what it's going to show is it's going to show a map of Wood Creek. On that map of Wood Creek, there are going to be orange areas. The orange area does not mean that that area has oak wood. It does not mean that area has oak wood. What it means is there is oak wood in the area from 32 years of us monitoring this within Wood Creek. And so if you are within that orange area, it could mean that you've had oak wood, it's moved on past the property because it's either A, killed the trees, or some trees have survived, some trees maybe were protected by fungicide, no longer there. It could mean oak wolves on the property and your trees are either actively declining or hopefully they've got fungicide and they're doing pretty good. Or it could mean that you are outside of that area, but within a range where you could realistically start to take proactive measures to prepare for and manage that oak wolf. So again, I want to be clear on that, what those orange blobs mean. You're also going to see some dash lines on there. They represent existing trench lines, and I'll go through and I'll talk about these uh, kind of one by one. So, again, does not mean each of those orange blobs has oak wolf on every single property. Again, it's just a uh, distance from where we have seen what is likely oak wolf. Mm -hmm. So, kind of going through uh, these individual areas, again, there are dash lines, which are trench lines. Uh, bottom left of the screen there towards uh, the Cypress Creek. I don't have a lot of information on that. However, to the best of my knowledge, that area was trenched. The trench has held oak wolf in place and it is fine. Kind of moving along the bottom of the screen there uh, on Champion Circle, there is an area with a blue and black dash line. That blue and black dash line was a trench installed in 2010. Again, to the best of my knowledge, that is holding there on the east side of that area. However, it does seem to be moving very, very slowly, kind of to the north and east on Champion Circle. The area is just above it on uh, Palmer Lane. Mm -hmm. The bottom one was detected in 1999, entrenched in 1999. To the best of my knowledge, that trench is holding effectively. However, we're now 23 years past that trench being installed, and we do have the risk coming from that, that blob to the south. Other area on Palmer Lane detected in 2005, trenched in 2005, again, to the best of my knowledge, holding everything fine within that trenched area. Uh, moving up to Wood Creek Drive, uh, area untrenched. Uh, I'm aware of it from 2014, judging by size, by the way. Older. Um, if you're within that area, uh, talk to me. Uh, but again, looking at uh, management options, probably look at some fungicide injections if you're around there. <clears throat> Two big areas further up, um, the one on Brook Meadow is our oldest one. That dates back to 1990 is when we first visited it. It was large then, it was trenched in 1990. So we're looking at probably some origination back in the 80s or earlier on that. Very old. Uh, to the north there towards Augusta, trench seems to have held pretty good. However, to the south, uh, we have seen it break out, pass by that trench line, probably because of age. Something else important to remember, that trench was installed at very old specifications, which I think were only three feet in depth. Again, we upped that because uh, it, we want more efficacy at four feet. Uh, other one, along kind of uh, Augusta, where it meets Brook Meadow. That was trenched in 2005. Um, that, that is uh, just the absolute, what we don't want to see, where it, it escaped on multiple sides, the trench was largely ineffective. And so you can see it, it's expanded to the So that's the issue as we know up to this point. Something I want to point out, though, is a lot of y'all have probably noticed Oak Wolf and Wood Creek. A lot of y'all have probably uh, known some of this history. However, you probably didn't know quite the extent here. 
and that's good, right? That's showing that diversification of trees can help us mitigate the risk of oak wilt. It's shown that there is some natural survival on our live oak trees, even left untreated, and it shows that people have been effective at using fungicide injection to keep trees alive and healthy. It also shows that we've had um, probably four trenches that have worked exactly the way we want. Where is the, whose camp is today? It would be, um, road on the far left um, hand side. Yeah. Is, is that Doolittle and the camp? This is, this is Doolittle. Oh, there's oh. the camp. Is this a map from the back? No. Do we have it on the west side? I took a picture of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I would say is I can make it available to city officials. Um, we don't publicly advertise this because, again, I've put a 100 feet line around here. A lot of people don't want, they want some anonymity. And uh, without me here to explain that there is anonymity here, this does not mean, again, this does not mean your property has open. And so, um, you know, I, I like that explanation because a lot of people might look at that and say oh my goodness uh i can't believe he said that and that's not the case it's showing areas that are approximate so if anybody were to share this photo it's really important that you carry that information with it because it's alarming otherwise yes and so we just want to make sure people understand not to not be concerned but also let's not spread misinformation that causes panic Uh, my contact information is up there, my email and my phone number. What our role with Texas and Forest Service is, is education primarily. We can perform a certain role in identification and uh, kind of education on management recommendation on individual properties. What I'll tell you is because of the current wildfire activity, I'm moving pretty much 100% to emergency response starting Saturday. And so I probably could not perform individual site visits until September or October. And um, I might be delayed in responding to communications as well. TexasOakWorld.org has a lot of information, though. Really great place. If you forgot something I said, it'll be up there. Also, uh, we have social media accounts, um, Facebook and Twitter at Central Texas, dash Texas and Forest Service at Central Texas. Another great place to learn about trees, oak wilt, issues impacting. And, and if y'all are okay with it, I'd like to, I can take questions if y'all have time. Yes, sir. I, I have two questions. Uh, I'm in one of the zones on Woodford Drive, and I've mm -hmm. treated our trees with one side, and it's been okay. successful. Okay. Um, two rounds of treatments. How often do you do those treatments? Thank you for the question. Um, so uh, two rounds of treatments, you mentioned, that's very often the recommended amount because uh, as mentioned, fungicide provides about two years of protection. So with two rounds of treatments, you're probably looking at four, maybe five, three to five years, depending on when the injections happen, of uh, protection. That's typically what we're looking for, for the fungus to uh, essentially realize that it's not able to colonize trees, move on past the area. We're looking at it, uh, I use a wildfire analogy, it burns, there are some things that can't burn, um, and so it just keeps on moving, looking for fuel, and after a while, there's not fire back where it once was. There's not fungus back where it once was. So usually about two rounds, sometimes three rounds, if necessary, I would say monitor tree condition to inform whether or not uh, you might not need to do that. And that would probably be looking for something development. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, one, one last question. Um, when the live oak dies, oak oak, mm -hmm. is it still infectious? No, if it, if it's dead, die from live oak. I'm sorry, die from oak wilt. Uh, it should not play a role in vectoring the disease and causing it to move to other trees. So leaving it standing, um, not a problem for oak wilt. However, in a residential area, could eventually eventually be contagious. Or and there's a right. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Yes. Um, when we're talking about the spread, you didn't mention feeding tools. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to highlight that. That's an important. Uh, so cleaning tools has never been a, a proven method of oak wilt spread, and that's why I, I leave it out there. Uh, it is a good idea uh, to clean tools 
Uh, there are other things. Uh, someone mentioned uh, Bradford pears earlier. Uh, there's a disease called fire blight. It's a big problem on pear trees. Um, that is vectored by tools for sure. So cleaning tools is a good idea, but when it comes to oak wilt spread, uh, it's never been proven. It hasn't been attempted even. Uh, so it's not a proven known method of oak wilt spread. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why it wouldn't actually, the number one being uh, tools, especially chainsaws, with exception. And, and again, heat fills. Uh, yeah, so same, same point. They've looked for uh, vectors in squirrels, woodpeckers, that kind of thing, have never been able to show any kind of spread of oak wilt besides um, a few species of that nitty-dula beetle and one or two other beetles maybe that we don't have enough. <laughs> well, one thing to remember with those beetles is they are everywhere. Uh, they are not an oak wilt beetle, they are a sugar beetle. And so they are, they are everywhere. They're a very, very common beetle. And so trying to control um, that aspect would be futile. No. The fungus the injection, how often should you do it? So I would look to do it if you know that you've got oak wilt within about 100 feet of you. Because that means you're probably catching it within a year to two years of spreading to your property. I would probably look to do it maybe about two years after that point. Uh, and as per Mr. Foley's question, that will probably be the uh, extent. However, if we are you know, two years after that second injection, still seeing symptoms in your yard or maybe really active symptoms in the neighbor's tree might look to do a third round. That's usually kind of the cap that we look at. Um, there is certain risk to the fungicide injections, which is one of the reasons why we don't want to do it just repeatedly and we don't want to do it if we don't have to beyond the cost. Um, so there is a certain amount that could be uh, harmful to a tree, mm -hmm. and, and generally one of the things that we're cautious about is uh, heat and drought with fungicide injections. And unfortunately, we're in a real bad time for that. Um, so if you have the luxury, if you are say 100 feet away from oak wilt, I would wait until probably the spring when it gets wetter and the weather is less stressful on the trees. If you are facing a situation where it's just showing up in your trees and you're within that threshold where it might still be effective, I, I would encourage you to do that regardless of the risk of the fungicide now. Thank you. Uh, how practical is it to trench in a closely packed community like Wood Creek with all of its utilities, cables, water lines, that no one knows where they are? Practicality uh, is difficult. You saw that there is a history of doing it. Um, what I'll say is, uh, I see it less and less these days than in 1990 when that first trench was installed. Uh, and one of the main reasons it goes back to uh, repair costs on sidewalks, on driveways, on sprinkler systems, uh, leach fields, you name it. That's where the real cost is. Trenching itself is, in the grand scheme of things, not that expensive. But when you factor in residential infrastructure, it, it becomes very expensive or, or much more expensive. It becomes challenging because you are now dealing with multiple different landowners. Uh, and it, with that many landowners, one of them is going to say, no way, no how. And so then you've got to look how we're going to go around that. Generally with trenching, I personally don't make that a recommendation unless lot sizes are about an acre or more. Mm -hmm. So in a Wood Creek type setting, Especially, you know, with the extent of some of our areas, I feel the practicality of trenching might be pretty low, except there are places, you know, maybe you can't do a loop around it, but there are places uh, similar to how they decided to go in on the, what's kind of close to the bottom center there, that blue and black dash line. You can see it didn't, doesn't go around the oak wilt. They just put it in to try to keep it from moving towards those few houses. So there are applicable areas, you know, specifically maybe around Camp Jones Judea, maybe around golf courses, maybe around undeveloped lots where trenching could still be feasible. Mm -hmm. But big picture as a management strategy for Wood Creek, uh, I see it probably as a, a challenging problem. I've also heard the comment from someone, is his name Clay Bales? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. That he thought with our karst Theology that the roots 
do not always confine themselves to five feet and above. Sure. So that could be uh, if you are in a, a karst zone. So areas where we have those, well, honeycomb limestone that has holes in it, fissures, caves, things like that. Uh, there's been research, live oak roots going down to a depth, of, I want to say about 20 meters, which is 60. Mm -hmm. There's no rock saw that goes that deep. Um, now, whether or not they're going and connecting to each other, I can't say that for sure. But certainly that could be a point that makes it deeper than the four or five feet that we're looking at usually. Um, and could be a factor on why we have seen some of the, the trenches within the area not perform well. Uh, I, I said we're at about 70% on trench effectiveness. You know, six trenches, Wood Creek, 66%. We're right on the average there for what we would expect. But there are numerous reasons why we use the failure. I was going to ask, what do you think Wood Creek to do? Um, that's a tough question. Um, I think uh, I would really harp on, on education and prevention because y'all do have many areas, but you've got many areas of town that are not affected and can remain that way with really good proper education. So especially with uh, new residents. Um, y'all, of course, do have a tree ordinance and I forget the exact regulations on that. There are some uh, small municipalities, very similar to Wood Creek, that outright um, <clears throat> ban trimming February 1st through June 30th by punishment of fine and require canning on oak trees. Mm -hmm. um, if y'all want to go in that direction, mm -hmm. there is a precedent. You do have that. Okay. So Wood Creek's one of them. Again, but uh, education, information, enforcement is all pertinent there too. Mm -hmm. Once you start talking about uh, the issues that we do have, again, education, which y'all are doing right now, on uh, how to manage, because there are a lot of folks out there that, uh, again, might not know how to manage, might start searching online. There are, unfortunately, some things out there that I didn't mention here because they are not recommended by uh, the Texas Oakwell Advisory Council uh, on treatment. And so there are some products out there that are occasionally sold that, um, I, I could not recommend money, put it that way. And so getting people information on the good recommended products, I think is key. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, we could talk about what the city might be willing to, uh, if the city is interested in containment, you know, maybe there are some places like we mentioned where if we partnered with some of the larger landowners, trenching might be feasible. <coughs> we could talk about that we could talk about kind of what that might look like um but it, it's i would not i'm not sitting here making a recommendation that we go out and trench the entire city of Wolf Creek because i think it's not the right way to go i thought living on Palmer lane when i watched them trench back in 2005 yeah i know that the healthy live oak trees that got spread they lost 40% of the candy. Sure. You, you're you're like severing that root system. In, in fact, there's um, on Palmer, yeah. uh, there is a tree that looks very poor outside of the trench line. Um, no other signs anywhere around the oak book could have been outside that trench line. And I attribute it likely to the trench line. It's hanging on, but mm -hmm. I just count the leaves. Uh, so our neighborhood, mm -hmm. both trees are dead. Mm -hmm. Does that mean it's dormant? Uh, not necessarily. I would expect it is still a, it's it's a spider web, and so mm -hmm. I would expect that it's in that root system. Mm -hmm. And so while the stems might be dead, the expectation and, and the unfortunate expectation I would have is, is very likely it's moving mm -hmm. towards your yard. Potentially, and that's that's another thing is lots of times folks don't know the history. Um, and, and again, there are a lot of areas, for instance, um, Brook uh, Meadow, um, which is the, the, the very old center. There are a lot of areas where uh, a property might have had Oakwell in 1989. 
and um, you know the new owner hears about Oak Wilt around and they're worried. In reality, they probably don't have much to worry about. Very likely that Oak Wilt is now moving out away from them, and, and they're relatively safe there on that inquiry. So, with what they. Yes, sir. And there's a kind of a city council policy question. I've had three different experiences with people I know personally where I told them that they had oak wilt. And like one of them said, well, what am I not supposed to buy the air conditioner that's broken down in my house? Another one says their kid is uh, in college, they can't afford it. And uh, then another one said, well, they're redecorating their house and they just can't afford to do it right now. And on all three of those cases, the trees got oak wilt and died. And, uh, but I had pointed out it was in proximity. So as long as we have people in the subdivision or in the city, excuse me, that, uh, Kind of ignore the problem. I'm not sure how we're going to be in the I, I, I think that uh, I live and have lived for many years in the area of Spalding Circle, Former Lane, Wilson Circle, mm -hmm. and that's what we and it was devastating to Former Lane, devastating. And uh, we were there when they did the ANN came in, they helped us with the injections. The, the trenching is there, and um, I think it's an issue of maybe understanding the value of the trees to your property. Mm -hmm. That that's something that I tell people, and uh, it is expensive. But I do I I have a fairly small lot, and it is packed with trees. So taking care of them. I just recently had an arborist come in, do an inspection, make some recommendations. Yeah, it is a personal choice, but if you're putting someone at risk, then I think that I have some new neighbors that turned, uh, moved in, and I was outside watering, and I see them going, they were starting, they were, they were the big shears going through the old trees. Mm -hmm. I put what I've done, I went over to them, I said, do not do this at this time of the year. They were very nice. I said, look, I don't want to be the nosy neighbor, but I'm telling you this with your own protection. And they said, oops, that you're right, so we'll wait. As they wait. <laughs> so sometimes you have to be found the little neighborhood cop. <laughs> hey, hey, with you. Hey, hey, I'm going to have to be there. I'm going to have to be there. What is the cost to the countryside? And does that yeah. have to be addressed to my art? <laughs> uh, great question. So the second part first, no, it does not have to be. Um, you can purchase the fungicide yourself, it's not a regulated product and that you need a license to purchase it. Um, you can purchase uh, some of the application methods yourself. Uh, it is difficult to purchase those macro uh, injection applicators that I mentioned there nowadays, um, but there are other application methods that can be purchased yourself. I, I will say that um, I've seen, I have seen really good results with DIY projects, but like most things, I don't in general, see quite as good results with DIY of well treatments versus professional of well treatment, but I do it regularly. So, follow up question pricing is typically charged per inch of trunk diameter. Um, typically, uh, more quantity, lower cost per inch. So, uh, if you've got a lot of trees or if you can get them to come out and do three houses at once. Typically going to be a quantity discount. Um, prices are fluctuating a right a lot right now, so I'm going to give you a pretty big ballpark, which is going to be somewhere, and it depends also sometimes on application methods, somewhere in between ten and twenty dollars per inch of tree diameter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I just wanted to bring up that, like, I just learned from Deborah how you know it is more, it's it's less expensive to treat your trees than than if they they if, if they die and you have to take them down and especially less expensive if the tree falls on your house or something like that so, or on somebody um, else's car yeah, yeah. yes exactly so it comes, you know that that comes with education because i never knew that until i heard never talking about it yeah. um we do have a full agenda for the regular council meeting i don't mean to you know 
set this down that is fascinating and, and incredibly important. I would say that you know this is just you know the first step. I mean, having having Mr. Clocky here to to do this workshop and to have all you on here and to be able to to have this out there for people to, to listen to again on the website is, is one one piece of the educational program. We're going to keep working with this. We're going to keep looking at ways that we can help citywide. And some of that, you know, may be financial. We we'll continue to put um, Oakville's budget, you know, on the books and be able to, to have money available to help. We do have an Oakville sort of um, savior fund, you know, where if, if you do lose a tree and want to replace it, you can apply to the city and and, and get some money for the for a transplant. But we'd like to go further than that, and we'll look at we we will keep looking at every thing the city can do to contain and manage it. But as Carl said, it's mostly yeah, you know, just education. You know, tell your neighbors, talk to your neighbors. Sorry, Pat, you did a great job. It just didn't work. Um, but you did reach out and talk to them. You know, and and we will go and you know we'll get this you know in in every house in Wood Creek, but you know it's like if they don't read it, you know it doesn't do any good. You know, so so it is a thing of a sort of that neighborhood cop, you know, the Oakville Patrol, you know, on the prowl. It's not all of us. You're here because this is something that interests you. Your neighbors aren't here, um, so share this information. Go out and, and spread the word, and, and we can save some trees. I think we saved yeah. a few trees just being here this afternoon. You brought several. Yeah, we've got yes, I brought several, and, and you all know how to find me. So if you need any more, I've got boxes. Uh, It's very much appreciated. Well, take just a couple of minutes because I don't think everybody was. Thank you. 
Item one is moved into the regular agenda. The minutes of May 25th. Right. All right. Here we are. Yes. I move that we approve the item two and three of the consent agenda. Second. Second. Right. So, so we move we move one into the regular agenda. Or um, we. Have a motion and a second by Council Member Hines to um, pass two and three under consent agenda. So both the consent agenda then. Mayor Pro Sam Aurora Lebrun. Aye. Council Member Chris Kummer. Aye. Council Member Deborah Hines. Aye. Council Member Brent Foley. Aye. Brent consent agenda. Passes with the exception of item number one, which is now the first item of our director agenda. Um, so I will um, I'll recognize uh, Council Member Drummer on his um, uh, any concern about the May 25th minutes. I have one question um, because it was highlighted. I wanted to ask a question on in the minutes on item 12. Um, what's highlighted is. At this section, an amendment was made by Councilmember Hines to have a city staff request from Jennifer O'Kane, O'Kane, the Gates County Tax Assessor, collected to prepare an impact statement of the overall revenue effective at the time of 20,000. My question goes to city staff um, Did you request from Jennifer O'Kane, O'Kane uh, an assessment, and what was the result? Yes, we requested the assessment. We did not get it. Thank you. I followed up on my I think we just forgot to remove that. Yeah, I saw it highlighted, so I assumed that was for reasons of asking the question. So I think I'm ready to approve the cons. You move the approval of the minutes from May 25th, and I have a second. Second. Councilman Pines. Go roll. Whenever you're ready. To, no rush. Council Member Chris. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> Council Member Chris Grover. Aye. Council Member Deborah Hines. Aye. Council Member Brent Foley. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem of Royal Brown. Aye. All right, the minutes for 25 at May 25th are passed. We'll move on to um, item mark number four on the regular agenda discuss and take appropriate action on finding solutions for the Oakwell in Wood Creek. Mayor, may I? Yes, please. I move that council creates an action plan towards preventing the further spread of Oakwell in the city. Second. Mayor, may I? <laughs> <laughs> Seconded by Council Member Hines. Uh, we had a great presentation today, and I think there's a lot of ideas. I'd like that we stress that we go forward with creating education as the focus. Um, but I also wanted to present just some ideas for topic. This idea is um, maybe possibly creating the position of a city arborist to specialize with specialized training dealing with Oakville. This person or firm could be on call, and someone such as the citizens could contact to gain information or come out. And we saw that his availability might not be that helpful, recent, or current. Um, another idea is to maybe possibly, are we, I was, I said they'd make a cursory city map, but it looks like we already made this one. Um, but maybe we could create a more updated map. Of actual hotspots, like what we're physically seeing. Um, another possible idea is to create incentives for property owners to address OCO disease trees. Um, and then, of course, the idea of sending out mailers to every address. And then also, I would like to seek out additional recommendations from the tree board to see how they would like to address OCO. So those are the ideas I'm presenting. I would love to hear more. Councilmember Hines. 
Well, I, I just wanted to follow up on things we're already doing or have in motion. So I have submitted a website page that is more detailed and specified about Oakwell to staff for them to publish. And it would link to this site as well, but it gives just a little bit more background information. We've also directed staff to begin putting out signs during the no pruning period to really highlight that. I believe that was in motion prior to City Manager Lewis leaving. So we need to check in about where that's at. And we also have a tree ordinance update on the book that um, strengthens our protections for our trees and does provide some of these incentivizing programs to deal with oak wilt to help residents cope with oak wilt if it's diagnosed. And, and again, um, if it's in that ordinance, if, if oak wilt is diagnosed, there's no penalty for dealing with those trees from the city. So we are trying, are ready to be in action about this. And I think that we can continue to do more. Um, and, and I think that Mr. Blackie just gave us a lot of really good tips and that we just kind of need to get all that information into one place. And I like the idea of, of promoting education. The tree board is planning an event already mm -hmm. um, to help with that as well. So all positive things. I think I'm going to speak to one of Chris's suggestions. I mean, I, I think if, if the city is truly interested, there's no better or clearer way mm -hmm. than to have a, a, a professional who's actually an officer that would be a very minor amendment to the code of ordinances, but the city wants to have an arborist that is that is designated as an officer in the code of ordinances, and then you could you could set the parameters of the work, whether it's you know once every three months or every month, every six months, but they, they drive through, they provide quarterly, you know, uh, annual updates, how, however you want to do it. But someone who is actually hired by the city designated by the city as the city's arborist and is the, the, the source of information in the city. That, that's something that could be easily created. It doesn't remind us. Would we actually have to have an ordinance for that? Could we not have a contracted employee uh, anyway? You you could uh, do it that way if you want. I, I, think, <clears throat> I, I think it's a cool model to it really speaks to a city's values that they build something in uh, like that to its ordinances and create that official uh, city arborist position and then give it those clearly defined expectations and duties. But you are absolutely correct. That could also be just as easily as handled with, with the I'm sorry, with the contract. I asked just because of funding purposes if we create a position for the city via ordinance that could result in a more expense, just consistent expense versus a, a contract with a, an arborist that the city has to deal with, who is more of like a as needed basis, it's a little bit different structure. Don't get me wrong, I love the idea of a city arborist, other cities do it, I'm yeah. aware, but um, I just I worry about our budget. We, the city, the city could by ordinance make it a make it a big arrangement, just just as they could with, with a contract. Um, so you know, if, if that's something the city wants to do. And, you know. it's not, it's, I mean, from what you're saying, it's not really that much different from the municipal judge <laughs> who is an officer of the city on a contract basis. Um, the judge was on retainer. Um, where a contractor could just be, you know, like as as needed and as paid. Um, I would suggest that we ask the tree board to, you know, put that on their agenda for that discussion. Be, I agree. I think that is going to be my recommendation that this we have uh, the tree board is actively working on this issue that we put on their agenda. I do want to take a minute to say that there's one thing that strikes me uh, very in not in a positive manner. I was here when we had the devastation from the lane and that old area that was in that old work. And one of the things that is different now was the involvement of the citizen. I don't see the same urgency. I go to what Mr. Rollins said. I don't see the urgency 
that I saw at that time. The citizens came to meetings. We had Texas A and M very actively involved and in helping us with the injections, with the trenching, with advice. And we have group, and I just don't understand whether, why. I wish, so, so I think that education and emphasis on education and how serious this is, uh, is important. We, I am concerned. We have had a big turnover in the population since that's the right, 19th that's right. and, and, um, <clears throat> and yeah. there are a lot of people who just don't get it like, like we did. They don't get you know, it. And so, and so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying, you know, through education, you know, make it top of mind again. Um, we're not going to have big trenchers, you know, running down the street again. But, um, but you know, we, we can reach them and we will. Yeah. So I agree. I, I think we should. I think the free board is a very good source. It's the, that's what we know. Put it over there. I'm just going to offer, you know, as a former city staff member, there's Few different ways you could fund that. Now, one way is take from the general fund, in which case you're funding the arborists from the, the tax base generally. Uh, another way is you know treating it sort of like you have a building inspector. You know, each time there's maybe a tree permit, maybe the arborist comes out and and that's part of the inspection process. And so that's kind of the opposite. One way is funding it directly from the general fund. All it's smooth peanut butters out to all the residents, or it's or that those costs are recouped. On a permit by permit basis, which means it's, it's recouped directly from the person doing the work. And in another way, potentially, is through contractor registration. You know, for lots of types of permits, you know, whether it's an electrical contractor, some state law says you can't charge fees for certain contractors, but, you know, solar permitting, those types of things, a lot of cities require contractor registration in order to be able to do business in the community. So if you require contractor registration, potentially for for uh, tree trimming companies, that may reflect in their costs. They may pass that on to the residents, but still, those are different ways to try to, you know, fund different plots, really different philosophies for funding uh, for your home. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd like to amend the motion, if possible. I'm going to say that, so right now, the motion is create an action plan to address those wells. And I'd like to amend it to say, Send recommendations of an action plan to address both wells to the tree board. And those would include a city arborist specialized and in, in trained, so a certified arborist contracted with the city, city map of both wells update, or like essentially one that we own that we produce, incentives to address mailers and more recommendations. Um, that the city council. Okay. I okay. move to make a motion to send these recommendations uh, in an action plan to the tree board mm -hmm. um, on how to prevent oak wilt in the city of Wood Creek. Hire up, look at hiring members, um, creating a physical map of the hot spot, uh, sending mailers, these mailers. Ideally, but this, okay. that would be what the tree board would address. Okay. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, so sending mailers and uh, conferring with the tree board with their whatever current action they're doing. Yeah, and then it's an action plan to address both well, not prevent. This is good. To address. Okay. That's why I read it. Thank you. This discussion time. Uh, we're discussing the amendment. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the council's going to send recommendations to the tree board, and you're going to ask them to we send back a, a physical city map of Oakville hotspots and then a recommendation to attend the city arborist. Yeah, we're asking we're asking the tree board to, to consider those things and we just set those as, as part of their overall plan, uh, and then come back to the council with recommendations, specific recommendations on, on some of those items in the action plan. Okay, on, on those two items, the physical map and the retaining city arborist. And incentives to address Oak Well mailers and any other recommendations. Oak Well mailers, ones, incentives, um, financial and otherwise. <clears throat> they're already working on their Facebook programming. It's out of help with what they're doing. Okay, so you're asking for this in addition to what they're already doing. Yeah. Okay. 
Right. Yes, it includes that in the in the list of things that we're doing. All right. Um, if we can if we can vote on the amendment, please. Councilmember Deborah Hines, aye. Councilmember Brett Foley, aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora LeBron, aye. Councilmember Chris Bremer, aye. The amendment passes, um, so we will vote on the main motion. Councilmember Drek Foley. Uh, aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora LeBrun. Aye. Councilmember Chris Grummer. Aye. Councilmember Deborah Hines. Aye. Thank you. Passes. Um, we, we did have a couple members of the tree board here, so. Um, not here. <laughs> 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 no, no, this is good. This is good. All right. So um I'm just gonna call them in the order that they're listed here. Um so item number five on the on the agenda discuss I take appropriate action on the resignation of the city council member who did resignate and entertain a motion to that effect. Um, I move that we accept presentation um, by Jimmy Peterson Dine as council member in the city of Wood Creek. And this, I need a second for that. Second. Call the roll. This is on the resignation. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora LeBrun. Aye. Council member Chris Grummer. Aye. Council member Deborah Hines. Aye. Council member Brett Foley. Right. All right. So that passes. I'm asked um, or I entertain a motion um, <laughs> to nominate uh, Joe Katarba uh, to replace um, Council member Brisbane, uh, former Council member Brisbane Dean on, on the city council for the current term that would expire um, here in November. I would like to make a motion that we accept. Uh, the application and uh, point of the Joseph Capata to the Woodbridge uh, City Council to serve for the uh, unexpired term of uh, former council member this and I second. Seconded by Council Member Drummer. Uh, any discussion? I just add that uh, that um, Mr. Capata is current chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, he has served in that capacity and was on the on the commission before that. He's got um, really a, a great sense of civic duty. Um, and I think it'll make a great a great council member. So um what's the call role. Council member Chris Grummer? Aye. Council member Deborah Hines? Aye. Council member Brett Foley? Aye. Councilman Mayor Pro Tem Aurora Brown. Aye. All right, that passes. And uh, welcome, Joe, wherever you are. I think he's vacationing. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, he'd be here and we'd swear him in and <laughs> sit him down. Um, but uh, but we'll, we'll get him sworn in the next possible opportunity. All right, I'm number six, discuss and take appropriate action on adding two alternate positions to the Parks and Recreation Board of the Wood Creek City Council. Which would be an amendment to um, section 157.002. Uh, Mayor, if I may, I have three motions. Mm -hmm. um, the first motion is I move to amend the wording of chapter 157 as 157.001 Parks and Recreation Board Created Duties Plan, section A. The Parks and Recreation Board is hereby created. The Parks and Recreation Board shall consist of seven members. Five regular members and two alternate members. Each of Wood Creek's five council members shall make one regular member appointments to the Parks and Recreation Board. The mayor will make two alternate member appointments to the Parks and Recreation Board, specifically a first and second alternate. All appointments shall be confirmed by a majority vote of the city council. In the event any council members or the mayor refuse to make an appointment, the vacancy may be filled by the majority vote of the remaining members of the city council 
no member of Parks and Recreation Board may be present, be a present member of the City Council. This is basically me standardizing our board. Uh, I'll second it. <laughs> is that on the agenda now? I thought we just it is on the agenda, actually. I mean, it's an all, it's a, it, you it, have to, you have to amend the ordinance, the wording of the ordinance to add the two children. Um, if I, if I may, I mean, the, yeah, we, I understand the desire to standardize how the, um, boards and commissions are appointed and, you know, we, struggled with having council members coming up with you know nominations I mean, it's just like like we're, right now we don't have all of our commissions and boards filled because the council members have not come forward with nominations necessarily that have that have been included as individuals you know so we've had to go out and try to bring up people in and then say oh here's an application and go okay so i don't know for a city of our size how how well that works just putting that out there um that's number nine and understanding what you're saying um i don't disagree i think you're absolutely right that we are struggling to find volunteers to commit to these positions and there's a lot of them so even though we have more participation now in our city from residents than ever before there's also just a lot of open positions um i i support the concept of the appointments by council members in general though meaning that for me in my opinion and in my experience previously as a resident it feels a lot better to have all five people saying, I like this person or I like this person and everybody kind of tossing a name in the ring versus the unilateral control of a single individual and nominating mm -hmm. all of these functioning bodies. So that's why I support this change in, in the wording. And so maybe we could reflect on the concept of the idea that council members are supposed to go out and find these people and, and work on the wording to be that they're selecting from applicants. So there's a broad application process seeking, and then council members have the right to make appointments from that. If that makes sense, it, it makes sense if it were happening in practicality. Um, so so what's been happening is we've had these vacancies on our board and commissions, um, and we wait for volunteers. And I wait for council members to come forward with, with names. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But um, but what's been happening is then I get on the phone and I start calling people, um, sometimes based on recommendations from you, um, sometimes because I, I want to get somebody on that board, you know, one way or another. Um, and so when I ask for a nomination or ask, you know, say, please consider, I mean, you don't, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to make the motion. Um, but, you know, I try to get these folks vetted uh, by you before they ever make it into the town. That, you know, they're, they're based on recommendation, but the, the process of, okay, Council Member Drummer has this person, Council Member Hines has this person, therefore Tim LeBron has this person, um, and they're filing applications and there's sort of this ownership. Um, that hasn't been happening, and I don't know if it can, I don't know if it will, I don't know if we're just not doing it right or, or what. So I'm all for I'm all for people coming forward with with applications, but we still have even even after the night when we fill a couple of these positions, we still have more. So what you're describing is a nuance of the background that this doesn't really change. Um, I really appreciate all the work you do in trying to find people for the position. I think it's, and when we pull these forms, you know, the city gets the forms, we've chased them down, I've chased them down, we've, you know, we've reached out to citizens to try to bring them to fill up the forms for us. Then we have a pool of forms and then we each can pull and go, 
you know, I would like to recommend this one. And often it's it's a it's still a discussion. It's still a group effort because we all have to be first. And I think that's I like that standardization of council is filling the position. Whether you as mayor are the wrong mayor. Wonderful mayor. A strong mayor. I want to name everybody that's going to sit on any board. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and in, in, in effect, if you're going out and getting all the names, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to do that. You know, I, don't, I think we all do. You know, the, whole, the, 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 the nice thing about this concept, this plan, is that it, it is the epitome of delegation, you know, out to the council member. Um, but if, if council member is not, if every council member doesn't come back, you know, with, with names, then we have we have vacancies on these boards, and if we have enough vacancies on the board, they can't even meet. So the, the interesting thing, if I may address that, um, that's why there's this particular stipulation that the majority vote. If one of us doesn't, the majority can vote in somebody. No, every, every every position is voted in yeah, by the majority. Correct, but if somebody chooses not to bring somebody forward. Mm -hmm. Or a position. Mm -hmm. The rest of us, we can still which we, which we we have already had to do um, on more than one. Now, Captain Number Four. If I'm looking at this right, it looks like there's two, two questions here. The one Jeff wants to work. One, two people, two alternates today. Um, I've got, I've got three. Okay. That have, that have turned out. Okay. okay. I mean, the junior audience says adding two alternate positions to the party. Oh no, 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 no that's. I'm sorry, not the parks and rec. The other to, to another body. I don't have any alternates at this point uh, necessarily for parks and recreation. But we on agenda item six. We're on okay. agenda item yes. six. Yes. Okay. I mean, I'm looking at that. It looks like you're trying to point somebody to parks and rec. No. Okay. okay. But then there's another question that we want to amend 157, which has changed the way that those people are nominated. I don't get that from this agenda item. So okay, so the I'm sorry, the agenda item at its most basic is parks and recreation. Right now is the only board that we have that is five members and no alternate. That's right. I mean, every other every other every other board has two alternates. Okay. And so I talked to the chair and said, you know, what do you think about amending the ordinance so that parks and recreation has Two alternates like the other boards, and so that's all we're that's all we're trying to do. Now, the wording of the ordinance does have to change in order to do it, and I, you know, I applaud you for, for putting that together. But I really don't have any objection, you know, to to it conceptually, and I don't have any objection whatsoever to having <clears throat> having our, our the appointment of our boards and committees standardized. Um, we just have to take the responsibility to make. Uh, I'd like to move that we table item six until we can bring up a revision um, for everyone to look at together, kind of incorporating this new language. Because I also believe that the location of the parks board in our code is incorrect. In fact, that's something I was recommending to the ordinance review committee already is something we look at mm -hmm. because it's out in this island and we've got all of these other boards in our chapter 30. So maybe as uh, Rumor and I can kind of work on cleaning that up and sort of reflect on this request that you've made of um, how, how we get the applications and this concept of council appointment versus how we seek applications and kind of cleaning up this process. I, I would like to second the motion. Today. So we're post to clarify we're postponing. Right, items yeah, and we're going to work on this. Uh, and and. You know, if um, that part of the so if it, if if we can get that wording together and then back to the, to the next meeting, so that we're actually voting on the on the wording, which is my fault. I should have I should have done that. Should have been that should have been back. I also want to make another note um, to this whole process that and when we send out you know, calls for applications, you know, they they pretty much come in centrally. Um, but as often as, as not, they come to me. 
-hmm. And so, and so I put them, you know, I give them to staff, I give them the packet. And so, so I, I sit here and I say, well, I request a motion to nominate Sue Smith um, to the position of this body. Um, and the person who picks up that motion, you know, is essentially taking ownership of that of that mm -hmm. member. You know, and if nobody wants that person on that board, then it died for like promotion. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, it is. You know, the process is it is funny. I'm I'm speaking more out of frustration at trying to build you know sparsely populated panels. Um, and that I think the thing I want to get there. As, as, as easily as we can. Yeah. Post summer, we're gonna we're gonna be more confident. Oh, I hope. Should we ask for raising hands? Happy <laughs> <laughs> are already on site. Yeah. Uh, thank goodness. Partially confident. So we I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a second and a motion. Motion, second, and a motion. Second. second. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're gonna go ahead and vote. Right. Council Member Deborah Hines. Aye. Council Member Brent Foley. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora Lorraine. Aye. Council Member Chris Bremer. Aye. Procedural question? Yes, sir. Um, that was an amendment, so we need to vote on the my previous motion. Mm -hmm. No, this no, was a table. table. Table, and then we have to do that next time. Did you use the word table? Table. Table. And he said the whole thing, all of it, sits in the next meeting. So we have to work backwards in the next meeting. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so this is um, perhaps ironic. Uh, item number seven. Discuss and take appropriate action on any work group citizens uh, to the ordinance review committee. Um, I have I have three names um, that have, have uh, come forward. Uh, I'll take them one at a time and request motions to appoint. Uh, May um, I ask a question for the board of information? Mm -hmm. How many positions are we filling? Three. I move we accept all three. <laughs> <laughs> I second. Now this one's Randy Renter, moved by Councilman Plan, seconded by Rumor. Randy Renter, Don Hector, and Steve. Steve Pasolacqua. Those are the three. We're taking them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Randy is a, is a full regular member. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah, that's So um, if we could. Oh. Councilmember Brett Foley. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora Run. Aye. Councilmember Chris Bremer. Aye. Councilmember Deborah Hines. Aye. Great. Great. Mayor, I'd like to recommend Donna Hector as alternate. No. She has agreed to be a full member. I recommend her as full member. Second. Second by Councilmember Foley. Um, Donna Hector as a full member of the Ordinance Review Committee. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora Run. Aye. Council Member Chris Drummer. Aye. Council Member Deborah Hines. Aye. Council Member Brett Foley. Aye. <clears throat> the third, um, the third citizen volunteer, um, and this would be for the other alternate. Role. David Lowe is, is one alternate already. This would be for the other alternate role. Um, we still have a member. We still have a member. Yeah, when we're done with it, we still have a member. But um, 
Right. 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 If we need, if we can convince one of the alternates to step up, um, that's what I'm working on. But for now, Mr. Pasolacqua has asked to be an alternate. So I, um, Mayor, I that motion? no, I move to approve the mayor's recommendation for an alternate. Of Steve Pasolacqua. Second. Um, second by Mayor Brooks and LeBrun. That's two for you. No, I'm approving your recommendation. Yeah. You're right. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. That's perfect. All right. Okay. Okay. Councilmember Chris Gummer. Aye. Councilmember Deborah Hines. Aye. Councilmember Brett Foley. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora LeBron. Aye. Thank you. Um, you know, that was all a result of two resignations on the ordinance review committee. Um, <clears throat> they, we'll start and, um, and Carol Wilson Carroll is yes. sadly moving out of Wood Creek, mm -hmm. the Wood Creek North, and, which is why he has to resign. Mm -hmm. yeah. Carol Wilson. Yeah. Um, He's going to Wood Creek North. Um, that was our chair. He's not big in the back. So, so we do have some more. Let to do on the ordinance review okay. committee, but I'm very happy to make it mostly, mostly positive. Um, so item number eight, I'm taking off the agenda because that was a mistake on the on my yeah. submission. Um, and let someone just have a nominee for the platinum rose stand. We're meeting next week, so okay. So would appreciate some. Maybe we can get some citizen volunteers to mm -hmm. fill that out. So number eight is off the agenda. Number nine is uh, the report on the Platinum Rose panel. Um, this is a uh, very brief report that Platinum uh, panel met on June 16th. And one of the, I would say, the most important item on the agenda was discussing options for street repairs or replacement. And um, I did my best to. Uh, to share the information from the financial consultant. And the panel members were unanimous in the following recommendations. Number one, the city council will begin the process uh, for street repairs or replacement. And this should include not only repairs or replacement, but an ongoing maintenance on a schedule rotation. Because the way it happens now is by the time we fix something, something this is, we do not have a thing. We do not have a regular scheduling arrangement. Also, the, the members of the panel discussed the financing options as presented by the financial consultant, and is there a recommendation that council initially consider the use of tax notes that made and what they discussed in the tax notes was yes, we do understand they do they do understand that the tax notes do not cover the entire the entire uh, Amount needed to repair or replace, but the tax notes have the flexibility where you can address, um, you can address the project or two, and then when you can, as well as maintenance, and then move on and possibly extend the tax. And this is, um, this was a recommendation, and then eventually at a future day, it's possibly uh, rolling into a bond. Those are the two recommendations. And uh, if, if I may add, um, we have a meeting next week. And in the meantime, the chair of the panel, Ms. Bailey, uh, there was a discussion and orientation from the financial consultants as to the process of, um, for financing and the options for financing. And I understand from Ms. Bailey that it was a satisfactory yeah, very satisfactory. So, what uh, would uh, this time the financial consultant has provided some advice, and rather than discuss that, he's doing it directly to council. But I feel that the appropriate mechanism is for us to bring the financial consultant's recommendations to the panel next week 
and have them the panel review them and come back to council at the next meeting with their full assessment of their recommendations and their I don't feel it's, it's correct for us to make any decisions without the panel members first having that opportunity. So that's what I would like to do. Um, this was not a recommendation at this time, uh, but um, we, the city manager, the previous city manager, had recommended two projects for drainage to be covered by the funds that we have from the American Relief Act. Um, the panel felt that there's a third area that needed to be addressed, and the chart and the decision of the panel was for each member of the panel to inspect those areas and come back to a meeting in July. And at that meeting, we will discuss their assessment of the three areas, and they would have additional recommendations. And that's a third location on both sides. I always do both sides and shady both. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So the financial impact is unknown at this time, although we do, we probably will have more defined information when we come back in August. And I do want to say, although it's not part of the report, I do want to say that I appreciate this is uh, the work the panel has done there, and uh, we have some great talent in the panel that will guide us in this process. So I want to uh, thank the chair and the vice chair are here, and I want to thank them in front of everybody. And we will be coming with more information and more recommendations. That is, that is music to all of our ears. I <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Captain Member Boyd. Uh, just two questions. Are, are you guys going to help us in terms of priority in terms of which roads to start with? When we're here. Yeah. 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 Can, can I get a little more of an illustration on what my recommendation was? One of the specifics of the recommendation, which may not have entered into the language of the motion, uh, the panelist Green, who is an inspector with the city of San Marcos, was actually his idea, and I thought it was fantastic. That was to divide the city into four quadrants or five sections and address each of the, of the quadrants individually with an individual tax note, maybe, or an extension of a tax, tax note. So we go to one quarter of the city, which, as far as I'm concerned, it can be picked out of a hat. We fix everything in that quadrant, and then we provide a new funding vehicle to address the next quadrant. By the time we get to the third quadrant, we'll be back to the first quadrant, providing periodic maintenance until every street in the city is fixed. Okay, the only I don't believe that was a part of the promotion. That was I mean, part of the It was a concept. But I think we've got new information today yes. about what really is workable. That's right. And I think we need the whole family to come together on that. So is that financial summary going to be part of the agenda packet? Yes. yes. We need to come together. That's the reason why I, I checked this recommendation with Ms. Bailey. This is the reason why this is brief recommendation because we did not have the time the input from the financial consultant. He's Correct. absolutely right. That was this morning. That was so the financial consultant has presented to council. There's a video of that. He also submitted all of their paperwork to the platform panel already. There was a new presentation held privately to some people. And is the information of that different from what we've already heard? Yes. Well, only in that the specific the amount that can be raised. Um, we presented a way that we, without raising people's tax rate with the new certified tax rule. Yeah. So we, it, was already, it was what was already presented to us. Because he, he did give us that information in the yeah. packet. And, we, and, and it, it is in your original uh, platinum panel packet. In that one. So you guys don't have it. Yeah. But yeah. 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 What was defined for that was the generalization. The more specific and they'll be provided. And, and there is, um, and very honestly, um, the departure of the city manager it was something that was leaving a vacuum uh, for the chair and the vice chair and the members of the panel because he, we were expecting the support in that area. So we 
we opted, we discussed what option was, and our goal, our goal was for this fair bailing to be brought up to date. She was not, the panel was not active at the time that the presentation was made. She was not there for her to learn what had been given to council in May. But in addition to that, to let the financial consultants know where the panel stands and to get additional input from them or suggestions on how this can be accomplished. I think at this point, since this, the other members of the panel are not here, I would like to prolong <laughs> that discussion until after a meeting of July 11th, and then we will come back with a more expansive report. My, my second question. Um, goes back to what Mr. Abney brought up because I I, 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 I I tried to watch that meeting. The recording was really difficult, and eventually I, I had to turn off because I wasn't getting very much. But I, I contacted a handful of people and asked, "Hey, can you give me a brief recap?" And what Mr. Abney said today was relevant, and he mentioned that that's how San Marcos does it, right? Is that what San Marcos and various municipalities? So what Mr. Green was stating is that San Marcos does a series of tax notes. And then titles them into a bond later, specifically. Actually, what he was saying, or? if I remember the way he's, I don't think that he went into the financial specifics of that. He was basically he was giving us a framework for repair and maintenance. Yes, yeah, okay. so that's that's the plan. That's, yeah. Instead of trying to eat the entire pie at one time, just take one slice of the pie and mm -hmm. eat it, and then move on to the next slice. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely replying. So is that something you guys are going to continue to evaluate the quadrant? Uh, or the, uh, the it sounds like there's, no, there's more specificity in the financials, and I would, I would like to see that information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one, one of the things that the platform panel has is platform panel, which is the integrated, if you want to call it, with a comprehensive plan. In the when you look at physical systems, here's my buddy. When you look at physical systems, the physical systems portion. Of the comprehensive plan, which will include the transportation plan, that is the responsibility of the platform panel. So, this is the beginning of that process. Thank you. Good. Uh, one next thing uh, the survey is that going out? Survey with the residents? Okay, do we have any answers back yet? Or? Yeah. Okay. On, the, on the funding? Yeah. Yes, we do. We, we went there. over it and we went over it yeah. last mm -hmm. month. month if I may ask the yeah, the survey. Has the survey. Has the survey. Has seen the survey regarding? Yes, that was part of the. Yes, that was discussed. In fact, in the, the agenda for June 11, the survey was included as in the responses and the citizens' responses. Um, so, yes, they have had all that information. In fact, they probably had more information. We have to be realistic. The survey is relevant because it's current. There have been, we have been studying this so many times that there comes a point that we have to say, okay, all of that past information and service and committees, let's just look at what we have and move forward. May but ask, the survey was taken into consideration. May I ask another question mm -hmm. then, regarding um, your funding? If the city chooses to send this out for a bond election, um, what is the deadline or date? For that to be put on the ballot. At this point, the earliest that the city could go to a bond election would be next May. Because so we, we, have, make the we, we, have, we would not be in time to do it to have it included in the November election. The reason we're looking at this structure and just got the information today besides, we can actually look at funding by October. So we can get the ball rolling and then in the future, then if we can get the vote from the public, it's a larger bond, which will then be spread out a longer period of time because taxes will be less impacted. Yeah. So it, the two phases really make sense. Well, this is very new information. And again, we will have to with the second plan to bond. You cannot, as I said, the earliest we can bring a bond, the, the vote is made, but if you want to start the process, you can have absolutely right. There is an option that we will discuss. We have some funding that's sooner than that. Thank you. Sure, Ben. Can you make that financial information that you got this morning available to all the panel members? Before it will be. Yeah, okay. yeah, I did. I was. I did not. Uh, 
question. Okay, that's <laughs> gonna come on the report. Okay. That's gonna come on the report. I mean, let's uh, yeah. we need the panel to meet, we need the panel to come to the recommend and then there will be a recommendation to council that will include all of the information. But uh I saw I'm sorry, I saw the information just before I came to the meeting. So maybe what uh it's up to Chair Bailey if uh, let, it's, it's kind of a summary and it's like a <clears throat> point action plan. But what I'd like to do is write up the additional data and, and the appropriate reasons that this is a yeah. Fair and that will be part of our that will be on our agenda and discussion right. next week. And maybe the council. Thank you. Uh, right. I'd like to move on again. There's no action on this no. item. Um, <laughs> There is a discussion to take appropriate action on the recommendations from Parks and Recreation. Uh, Mr. Bremer. Mayor, I move to accept the June 1st, 2022 Parks Board recommend, meeting recommendations for the date, time, and location of spectacular event and spending $1,000 already budgeted towards preparations for that event. Second. Second by Council Member Hines. Um, so the way I wrote the particular item is I used it as kind of the place to do the report. I just wrote it out. Um, we've already, the council's already um, addressed the recommendation for the Big Sand Park Board. Um, so what was the only thing left that Parks Board has requested was they wanted us to approve the, or acknowledge the spectacular event. And approve the funding. And approve the funding. Um, they did vote for the funding, even though I understand it's already budgeted and it's already done. Okay. Well, so this, this should be an easy vote. Correct. It yeah. should be the dollar roll. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Deborah Hines. Aye. Council member Brent Coley. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora LeBron. Aye. Council Member Chris Grummer. Aye. Thank you. That uh, motion passes. Um, looking forward to a spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> it was great last year. Building on that. I'm just going to let Council future, know. Future Council Member <laughs> I just want to let the Council know that I ran the two largest inflatables that exist <laughs> on the planet. One, six, 168 feet long, and the other one's. I think 72. Wow. So is one for adults this year? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're both ready for adults. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like seeing the kids in a bomb. Yeah. Jump on out there for the last. Also on that on that the part of that funding is to make him take the refund back. Or make him <laughs> take the refund back. During the meeting, he was like, no, 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 don't worry about it. Like, no. They no. voted against him and he makes him. The, I can't really recall ever turning down any money. <laughs> well, you did okay, we did move on to number 11, discuss and take appropriate action on, on the Park and Recreation Board LCR grant. Mayor, if I may, please. I move to accept the Parks Board recommendation for the LCRA grant. I gave you all the packets in front of you. Um, so, I have a question. Did I get a second? Oh, uh, second. Yep. Second. Second is by okay. Council Member Hines. Mayor, if I may? Please. Give one little bit um, The total folks add up to $12,630. The Parks Board might have some other details, so they have, would like to be looking at a fifteen dollars to $16,000 grant. So the twenty, the city's twenty percent match, but this would be three thousand for a fifteen thousand thousand grant, or three thousand two hundred of sixteen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so has this? I, don't, I'm, I'm, I might have missed it, but has this gone before parks yet? Or this is parks. No, no, I know, but did. Because uh, Parks Board said we're going to research the grant and put together a packet for council. Has the Parks Board seen this packet and voted and approved on it yet? 
What they voted and approved on was to have a subcommittee get this packet to council by this date, so that because the deadline is third. Okay, I just wanted that yeah. clarification. So they did vote to get a subcommittee to Okay. And that's what this is. So basically, what we're asking is is the approval to go forward with the grant based on the yeah. application based on this correct. Ooh, that's what I understand. Uh, I, so I looked at all the materials and I just want to clarify that I understand the design of this. So we're removing the concrete base and walling it off. And there's going to be a gate now to get into it. No, 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 no. More, that's, that's what I can clarify that if you'd like on there. Yeah, the, the, the gate you're seeing is a modification to the Bocce Court and the uh, Park. To allow handicap accessibility. Yeah. The demo of the concrete is a memorial park. The uh, slab there has failed. Okay. Yeah, this yeah. is this is all this 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 wording this like um what's in the concrete yeah. is just going back. Yeah. Um so the concept and, and what um Chair Rawlings has found is that there's a um, someone a foundry who will do basically what this is. Um, in bronze, so they last forever, right. and put it on them. So, so this is um, it's, a, it's a little bit of work now, but it will last a long, long time. Okay. This does not last a long. Time. Yeah, I just didn't understand this one image what it was, and now it makes more sense that the the items were just not divided in the. Okay, I got it. All right, I'm ready. Okay, shall we go? Motion. Yeah, motion. Second. second. There was an amendment. Yeah. No, 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 no. So the original motion is I move to accept the parks board recommendation for the LCR grant. Okay, but what about the part where it's for more money? No, that's just me explaining. Oh, okay. That's okay. Yeah, it's just so they can move forward with the grant. Yeah. And what was the measure? Mm -hmm. 30 to 20% actually is how much is 3,000? And then for 3,200 based on 15,600. <laughs> So we do need to make sure that that's in the budget planning mm -hmm. for that for next year. All right, roll roll please. Council member Brett Foley. Aye. Council member, Council member Chris Grummer. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora Brown. Aye. Council member Deborah Hines. Aye. All right, good to work on that grant. And um, Council Member Kermit, you also have a motion uh, for Parks and Recreation Board to consider creating certified wildlife habitats. Mayor, I move to take from the table to refer to the Parks Board seeking recommendation on creating certified wildlife habitats in Wood Creek Parks. You're moving it? From the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was on the agenda. Right. Okay. Of, so we're bringing it back from the table to the, to the agenda. Room. Uh, second. Seconded by Council Member Hines. Um, um, I'm 12, page 63. So this was about a certified wildlife habitat that I was picking it off of uh, one, the comprehensive plan survey says that the number one thing that people like most about Wood Creek is the natural beauty. Um, and I was looking at Augusta Park in particular, but there are other locations such as Creekside Park. Basically, when, when it comes to playground design, often they refer to the ideas of children being integrated with nature. So often they design areas of the playground to be naturalized parks or uh, butterfly education. Mm -hmm. So creating certified wildlife habitats or like parks board to look at our parks mm -hmm. and see if there's areas they could see mm -hmm. where they could become certified and they could go back. Mm -hmm. um, I know citizens have actually who live near Augusta, we have kind of a natural wash and they've been treating it much like a pollinator garden. That was that was designed as a as a rainbow. Correct. And she had spoken to me and said, you know, I would really love to make this more of an 
artificial playground or, or, or habitat, mm -hmm. and then do tours like for youth, you know, bring them to it, explain what the plants are, etc. And so, um, I'd like to move this to the parks or to have to move it or not. So the kind of like what we unofficially did with the brook meadow in right. the pollinator garden. Yes, and this would be certified. So there are little boxes that they put there, very easy. And then the cost would be a hundred dollars for this little long sign. So you need to see the motion. I figure so moving. We have to save this now because we just moved it off the table. So now we need a motion to. I move to take to the tip from the table to refer to the parks board seeking recommendations on creating a certified wildlife habitat in Wood Creek. Yeah, that's what I thought would be. Yeah. So, so I that, that was the full motion. motion. Yes, full motion. So I am okay. referring. Yeah, the motion is to refer to parks to seek their recommendations. Okay. And a second to yeah. discuss any further discussion. All right, we can call the roll. <clears throat> Mayor Pro Tem Aurora Lebrun. Aye. Councilmember Chris Drummer. Aye. Councilmember Deborah Hines. Aye. Councilmember Brett Foley. Aye. And and I also think, you know, just the the nature of the tree board um would have them as some supporters as well. All right. So um, that passes. We'll move on to item number 13, uh, Council Member Foley, discussion and appropriate action on the current city resolution. This is coming off the table, too. Yes, I uh, we, we consider revising uh, the current city resolution uh, concerning the time and place for regular council meetings. I second. I second. Uh, the reason I, I posted or this agenda item is to, to take a look at do we still want to meet at 6 30 for our regular meetings and do we want to mandate that our, our regular meeting place is always camping on Judea? So take a look at uh, page 79 of your packet. That's where the current uh, ordinance is right now. And you'll see that right now it provides that the uh, council shall meet at Camp on Judea uh, and all meetings are going to be held. At 6 30 p.m. Anything other than that is, is a special meeting and that has its own quorum requirements and, uh, and concerns. So uh, I would propose, and we talked about this before, but I would propose that we have council meeting show me a campaign today or here would be regular meetings. But I'm concerned that we may not be able to do that. I don't see any prohibition in, in government code or any pro sales. I think as long as we you know, stay on the agenda, it, it, Posted and it goes out that you know we'll meet either here or there. I think we make the open meetings act requirements. 6 30, you know, I'm just concerned it's just going to kind of get late in the night, and I think it's hard on staff. Um, so I just you know think maybe we'd like to consider moving that to maybe an earlier time. Um, so can we want to break that into two motions? Can we, we have a motion already. Oh, well, they had another single, right? Okay, I think any motion tonight. Um, I have a question to our people here. Um, the code, the code says that we must state the time and location in resolution. Can we state two locations? Um, that that was that was essentially the, the, the question that we looked at. There was an old old appellate court case. That essentially stood for the proposition that failure to state a place when the place was commonplace did not render action void. Um, can you say that in human terms? <laughs> failure, failure to explicitly state where the meeting will occur when the place in which the meeting occurred was a place that the meetings commonly occurred. If it always occurs at City Hall, can you admit that one time you're not breaking the law? Yeah. Because everybody knows where it's at. Um, but it's still shifting it to not be a regular meeting. Mm -hmm. not, not necessarily, because there's nothing in the code, in the, in the local government code, that makes it singular. It just simply says you shall state the place where meetings will occur. 
if you could you could read that pretty singular, but I actually when Brent and I talked about it, I I thought if you you listed two common places, someone could object and enforce the change if they want to file a lawsuit, but and if it very very clearly says the meetings will either occur at City Hall or Camp M today and people get proper notice, that arguably satisfies the problem. Can I ask you have the member lines? Oh. So there's a little bit of point of order here. I, did anyone second that motion to pull it off the table? Okay, good. Well, uh, if you want to continue, I was just going to make a, a motion to satisfy those okay. issues. Okay. Um, the second question is, uh, Oh, so we said all such meetings shall be held on the second Wednesday of each month. How specific do we have to do with that language? Could we say we shall meet once a month, or we shall all regular meetings shall be twice a month, or can we decide that, or is it very specific? I think you need to say I, the day, the, the day, the week. Okay. Move I'd like to move that we change the uh, wording in item A. The state, the city council shall meet at Camp Young Judea or City Hall as stated. Put that the city council shall meet at City Hall or Camp Young Judea as stated in the agenda packet. Or does it have to say notice as stated in the public notice? I second. Second that's on the firmer. Yeah. It just notifies people to check the notice to see which location is at. And so I think that satisfies the concern of the, the vagueness of listing two locations. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in all reality, if this were in Austin and you know, San Antonio, and you said meeting locations at Polo Austin and City had 50% of the it's three minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So the, Can we vote on that one? Yeah. Okay, Council Member Chris Schumer? Aye. Council Member Deborah Hines? Aye. Council Member Brett Foley? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora LeBron? Aye. All right. Fix that one. Fine. <laughs> Give her some time. You have a proposed time you're looking for? I know. The only proposal I would have is I mean, I can say, I am at 5 45. Clearly, I would want to make a motion to that. We wouldn't even make a motion, then we discuss and get into that. All right. Well, I would maybe we would change our meeting time to 5 45 p.m. I mean, that's what we say. I second for discussion. Second by Council Member Hines. You know, I, I'm flexible on this. I mean, I, I mean, six thirty is okay. I'm just saying if we make a little earlier, maybe we need some more folks. Uh, five forty-five, maybe too early. Five thirty, maybe too early. Six, maybe okay. I, I don't know. I just think we ought to talk about. It. I would. So, if I may, my my right. biggest concern <laughs> with moving it too much earlier is people who don't work here being able to make it. And I understand there's a lot of projections on how many people are in the audience and does it really matter but it's not just about being physically present in the room it's also about being able to tune in and you know get, getting home from work and being able to watch and so the concept to me is not whether or not they are it's the accessibility of it that we have to focus on because that's what law says essentially so 545 is possible. Six o'clock makes me a little bit more comfortable because that gives somebody time to walk in the door and use the bathroom to get your clothes to the mm -hmm. I just I actually like the 630 because we also have a special meeting and we've been having two meetings a month. And a special meeting could be set at a different time. But we at least have one meeting a month where we are catering to people who work in Austin, they work in San Francisco. And then we have another meeting that's possibly earlier. If, if, if your concern, if your focus or concern is people who work outside, that may work in Marcus, San Antonio, or Austin, as someone who commuted to Austin for over 20 years, 6.30 would be possible to make. 
any earlier. And I'm at 6 30. And with the way the traffic is, you know, but at least. You know. uh, I could tell you, <laughs> recently coming up dancing in Austin at 5 o'clock, we could make it to the by 6 30. I mean, maybe 20 years ago, but now. Well, I, mean, I don't know if we're solving that problem. Even though maybe we're I'm not necessarily saying that there is. Or specific people from going to hospital. Same thing, same way. But, but you know, yeah, okay. I, I kind of think we're solving. They were not solving that problem. I mean, I don't know if it's really a problem. It's efficient for us you know, to be a sister. Well, we're, we're solving something that's really not a problem. I mean, it's not fixing it anyway because you're not going to make it by sister. If I may, I think. I, I just want to. Um, briefly explore the concept that there's other ways to solve the issue aside from changing the time which would be um council members uh being willing to move agenda items staff mayor's request to the special meeting and that one being held earlier in the day or maybe a little bit more focus um on how much we put on each agenda I mean, the, out of, Mayor Roscoe, out of respect for council members and for this resolution, has been putting everything we submit on every, you know, the, the one we submitted for. And um, I am guilty of uh, raising a red flag if something gets bumped or, you know, wanting to talk about it. So I think we can work on, on that behind the scenes process a little bit. And assist in there on, on the scheduling things, and that might alleviate the time thing. And I'm also willing to say six o'clock um, as well. Uh, 545 to me is just cutting it a little bit close. And you know, 30 earning 30 more minutes is, is good. So that's kind of my general. So I'm going to refer to the comprehensive plan survey and the results there, as well as um when the time was previously changed, the, the comments from the citizens was to move it to this later time. And that's why council at the time moved it to 6.30. And there was a great support for that. And after that meeting happened, I had received citizens emails thanking us for that. So personally, I don't feel given that kind of response from citizens. I didn't hear anyone say, oh, no, no, that's too late. Nobody ever told me that. So for that reason, I will, I will announce my intention to stay with 630. If, you know, if we can, and, and I really appreciate what you're saying about this, because um, when we kick this off this council, you know, part of the agreement was that, you know, council members can submit items of the agenda and they will be heard. Um, you know, and there's only been a couple of times when I've contacted someone and said, do we really want to do this? I mean, it's like you know, they, they make it to the agenda. Um, and if, if we are looking at a full agenda on a 6.30 start, um, then maybe we do take a look and shift some things that are not a, a high, that high priority. Um, you know, there are, there are objections to even having two meetings a month, which, you know, to me is like, that's not uncommon at all. Um, and if we and if we do structure it so that, you know, the regular meeting is on the second Wednesday at 6.30 at either here or the camp, then we've got that. You know, on the books, and then we call the special meeting because we're going to talk about one here in a minute. Um, that that might you know might work up there. So and and you know we do have this information posted. So if somebody can't make a four thirty meeting, you know, then they'll be able to respond. So so I'm um, if you will. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. No, keep you still talking. No, okay. okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to listen on that. Um, I think the, the issue was when we first got here, the meetings were set at 2.30 in the afternoon. And I, clearly, that's not good. Uh, so I think it's the right to move. I just wanted to have a discussion of whether or not we need to make the meeting 
maybe a little bit earlier. I'm going to go with the six and we'll just get starting. Um, fine. I think we can do better in terms of a how we set up the agendas and also how we move the agenda uh, and get our business done. So, uh, so what what is on the table right now? Is it six o'clock or you said four? Five forty-five. Five forty-five. So how do we want to do that? Do we uh, do we amend? Um, or do we just yeah, vote for it? I'll, okay, I'll withdraw that motion and entertain any other motion. Wait, so we don't. If it's already said it's 630, so you wouldn't have to. We wouldn't have to have a motion to keep it at 630. Yeah. Is that the consensus now? Let's keep it at 630. Okay. Well, we could make a motion to. Keep it at 6 30. I don't think we need to be good, but I think that I think that people are in general okay with that. I mean, two things. One is it it does give us a chance to go home, get a sandwich, relax, and come back. Um, you know, I'm as concerned about staff time as anyone. Um, and one of the things that, that you know I'm all for is some. Um, Less time as far as it goes if you know you're going to be here, you know, on a, on a Wednesday night late. Um, and we need to, you know, work that out on as far as office. You know, somebody in the office like the next day or sometime during the week. You know, I am absolutely all for collaboratively, you know, making sure the office is open. But I mean, I can sit here in the office too. You know, so, um, so, and so can anyone else. So, yeah, so that it's not it's not an overwhelming burden on staff. So, All right. So as it goes, I mean, we've already approved um, the two venues. Um, we're leaving the time alone, and we're still okay with the second one. Say, so then I think we can move on to um, fourteen. Everybody good with that? Do we need to come back with a resolution? We need to, um, yeah, we need to amend the, the existing resolution just to, to add those. You can just change the language when you submit it because it's not a significant change. We're not rewriting the whole resolution, so it can just be changed. Yeah. yeah. So well, that language. Change. Change. Our yeah. vote changed because it's not a full. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just plug in the information and see if you can get yeah, the motion is to the motion. Yeah, but you can move yeah. to accept it. Yeah. We're not significantly changing it. If we were significantly changing whole paragraphs, we'd have to bring it back to the public view. But so we'll just we'll just make that that amendment just on paper, and then we'll sign it and it will be fun. Um, Councilman Foley, I'm um, 14, is yours on the traffic enforcement activities? Yeah, so this is just a report item. So first up, I'll refer you to page 86 in your packet. Uh, that's a series of reports. Uh, it's given by the, uh, the police County officer uh, after the shift. We're still doing the weekly shifts. Um, and we're getting the reports from the officers. Take a look at page 87. There's a report uh, on at the bottom on June 22nd, we know that there were nine tickets written in four hours. Yeah, so it was a busy guy. Um, this guy came back. Uh, I think the problem was we, we don't have his report yet. One of his stops was a, a guy doing 51 miles an hour on uh, on Burke Hall. So that's the kind of guy that we want, we want to get. So um, there is activity. It looks like it's working pretty well. I'm going to refer you to page 35 in your packet. Uh, that's something we talked about before, which is kind of the elements of, of a program to reduce speed. Um, you know, two of the, the things that you see is community awareness, which Edward is working on. We have the picker, which is coming out, um, and also the uh, you know overall community involvement. That's important. I think we're working on that element. Enhanced enforcement, we're working on that. You know, I just this is kind of like trying to eat soup with a pork. I mean, you can get some of it, but most of it you don't. And I, I hope it's having an effect. I don't know what the answer to that is. Is it will be more patrols? What? The other thing is we're eventually going to have to look at you know engineering solutions in terms of you know what we're going to do to these major roads. That's you know, isn't it? Yeah. That's you know that's, that's, the, that's the thing is like if, if we do that right, that's 24/7, 365. 
where the trolls are four hours a week. Yeah. So, I mean, we can do a lot to mitigate traffic and speeding um, with some intelligent bombing, which was also pretty highly rated, you know, in the in the survey. Um, and as we do look with the platform panel on what you know roads need to be worked on, you know, I would ask that K Freeze or who we're working with on all of that, you know, put that top of mind, not just laying the pavement down, you know, but but including you know traffic calming, which we had requested or would pre drive and couldn't make that. You know, so. And for Rob, is that something that's incorporated in, in uh, the platinum panel in terms of they're looking at you know the roads going forward? Roar. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, the, the, for, for traffic uh, calming solutions, are those part of what the platinum it, is? Yeah, that's mean? part of the when we look at when we look into uh, repairs, replacements, yeah, traffic calming solutions. That's something in the survey, the comprehensive plan survey, the citizens were specific that they wanted those, so we will have to look into those. And just one right. more thing I don't Am know. Am I right? But is that something that yeah. Freeze can help us with? I mean, that's I what we have plans to help you on that. So the upcoming uh, the upcoming citizen uh, meeting that we're going to be having on the 27th, that's going to be part of the feedback that we're going to be giving. We just yeah. actually had a meeting last week in Langford where we get similar stuff. And we had a really awesome exercise where we just went out and we showed pictures, just literally, just, just quick, just print out pictures of different street design, traffic calming types of solutions. And we just kind of laid it down as sort of like yeah. a game of pin the tail and the donkey. Where yeah. you get to like, what do you like? Do you like bulb out to the theaters? Do you like, you know, keep it simple and speed bumps or, you know, a little cross, you know, so you can, citizens can just kind of put down what they like. And then at the end of the evening, we tally it all up and, that gives us an idea. And go out there with the caveat, you know, we can't do everything, but at least we, we get an idea of what your what your biggest desires are and that helps helps you all prioritize. So totally planning on doing that on the twenty seventh year. Yeah. I think one of the things that when you get into the actual repair, you know, replacement, most of the, the let's say for example, Champion Circle is the three thousand. As number one priority, let's say, for example, I think when you put out your request for proposals, you incorporate in your request for proposal that you need to not only have the replacement of the sleep, you need to have those responding to provide alternatives to the um, provide alternatives and suggest recommendations for traffic calming on that street and. What I would say is something like this, which is back to how we did, uh, and you do many projects when you go for bids in the state, then you have four or five bids, then you have a vendor conference, and then you invite the public to come and look what they're saying and what vendor A suggested versus B versus C. And that would be a component of whether or not they get the award. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I okay. think it would have to go. The other direction. I mean, if we're yeah, working with yeah. the engineers on the design of the roads, that is part of the bid package. It's built in there. I mean, they're bidding on it, you know, from yeah. the get go. So. I also wanted to kind of go off of stop coming. Um, all the work that the, the city is doing currently with trees also is an aspect of stop coming. Absolutely. Um, done all these studies of that people instinctively drive slower when the tree canopy is over them. When there's a tree coming, uh, absolutely. Or, or a tree in the middle of the road. Or a tree in the middle of the road. And so, if I, if I mean to, I, I'd like to you know, thank Councilmember Bully and his team for um, doing some really good work here. But also, you know, I, I wish that um, we said something when um, when Pat Rollins was still here, you know, give them credit for the design of the sticker. And winning oh, yeah. the winning the Sticker Sorry. Award. So Sorry. Pat Rawlings, if you're watching out there, that's thank you for a great design. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, we all do. <laughs> yes. So anyway, I just wanted to give Pat credit for, for that design and congratulating him on his big win. And thank you, Aurora, for making the the happen. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Thank, thank you. Good work, especially on this this uh 
traffic enforcement it, report is awesome. It, it is, it's awesome, and it is having an impact. I mean, I mean, Monica and I talked about it. It seems like people are going a little bit slower, except that guy yesterday who was tearing down a guest to drive at probably 51 miles an hour mm -hmm. with another car coming the other way. Yeah. yeah. The so. one ticket I absolutely love that you get was that KLJ ticket. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and that's so, important. It's so over yeah. Yeah, I think we're good. Just one last thing. Um, probably going to be yeah. relocating the uh, radar stations. We're oh, yeah, yeah. working on that. So. Yeah, good. I appreciate you helping that off. Okay. Um, okay, so number 15, um, it is budget time. Um, I, I did. It's not in the packet. It's not in the packet. Um, but I have been doing some preliminary work on the budget, and I, I passed um, I passed out a couple of spreadsheets. I've got access now to the QuickBooks Online program, and so I ran all of our income expenses up to today. And so that's the that's the statement of activity October 1 to June 14. And then for fun, um, I ran June to September of last year. So that would be the, the last. Um, last few months of the fiscal year. So if you put the two together, um, you can look and see that you know it's showing uh, income, income revenue uh, for the year to date at about uh, 838,000 or so. Um, that does include 213,000 um, from the Recovery Act funds that were uh, received. So that's not a regularly budget item, but uh, but anyway, it is on the it is in the members there. If you take the um, the revenue from the last portion of last year, um, you know the revenue, as as we all know, tends to peter off at the end of the year. Most of our money comes in early through FOR or taxes yeah. and otherwise, but but we do get some we do get some funds from sales tax and, and even some lay out at FOR and taxes. Um, and so, you know, you can sort of do the math on that and see that that maybe that sixty-four thousand is um, uh, if we add. I don't think it's going to be sixty-four because there's some. You know, I don't. It doesn't look like we're going to get the same number of like residential permits and and some of those other um, income. That nineteen thousand dollars for the middle of the of the stage from the from the um, last year's peak. But you know, even so, if it's another. You know, fifty thousand dollars in income for the rest of this year. That puts us at about you know somewhere in the eight hundred and ninety range um, for the year, uh, a little under nine hundred thousand dollars in revenue. And if you look at the accounting expenses on the on the third page, um, the fourth page is mostly um, um, thinking funds you know, so or our um, debt debt payment. So if we're looking at strictly at operating revenue. Um, then, then um, the last few months of the year is still pretty heavy. You know, if you look at last year, um, we had we had total expenditures of about two hundred seventy-one thousand dollars in the last few months of the year, and and I started doing the math on that as well. You know, we're not going to have missed report cases. You know, through the rest of the year, there's several things in here that we're not going to be paying for that we did before. Um, this is we're not. This is some of the revenue is not going to come in. Some of the expenses are not going to come in either, including some of the like litigation costs and things. So I did a little bit of this sort of yeah. sort of you know paper bag math and came up with you know we're, we're probably going to have ex, you know additional expenses of. You know, maybe 100. So anyway, it looks like it's looking like um, we'll end the year at about 630k in expenses. Um, we won't have a chance to spend, you know, much of any of that um, recovery fund money. Um, but that leaves us with a with a surplus um, excess revenue of about 250, 260 thousand yeah. dollars. Um, so so the rumors that we're bankrupting the city are, are probably wrong. Um, <laughs> Not just wrong, but very wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, speaking of things for the for the for the that were budgeted for this year, what do we know about the post shop plan? We um so um Mr. Rawlings and I uh, met with Commissioner Shell. 
Um, but definitely I'll go that for you. Um, we just asked the, the POSAC um, the POSAC team recommended us for $75,000 of the grant um, request. Um, and so we went, we had a meeting with, with the, the consultants on that who gave us the advice that, you know, talk to your councilman. This is the POSAC team making recommendations. This is not the commissioners. The commissioner's court makes the decision. You know, so, so talk to them. So we went and met with, with Commissioner Shell. Um, and um, and he basically said, no, this is good. I mean, we want you to do this. It's shovel ready. You know, it'll you know it'll look good. I mean, it's something that's that's needed. Um, these grant requests are floating all over the place. Some of the I mean, some of the big projects, you know, have been like snapped up by developers or whatever. And so you know, they had you know a few million over here that now has been released because that. That project's not going to happen at all. So it is so fluid that he said, you know, just come to us with a firm proposal. So we asked um, our city attorney, Mr. Limor, to help us out with that. So he um, drafted um, uh, an agreement, an interoperable agreement with the county for the full amount um, and presented it to the county attorney um, for. Um, for Commissioner Shell to to present when the time is time comes, but his but what he assured us is he's presenting for the total number. Okay, so then we will. We don't know if it will come up. If it comes up, if it comes up in this fiscal year, we we've got the money. Got the money. You know that gets spent. You know if if not, we carry it over okay. into the next budget yeah. year, but. but you know, just say a little prayer, everybody, tonight um, that, you know, they get it on the agenda and, and pass it. But it is still very, um, yeah. it's a very strong case for um, our friend. Can you give you a timeline? He didn't. Yeah, people like, you're like me. I just, uh, I, 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 I sent the initial email to Mark in the last month, and I just didn't follow up on that. Thank you. Um, so, uh, back to the budget, yeah. actually. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that. Yeah. So, last year, when the budget was decided upon, the, the sitting council and city manager Lewis had this document. And on the document, there's the, the, the maintenance and operation budget, right? The full year projection, all these very specific categories, and a lot of it. You can't wiggle too much because it's just like our normal expenses. At the bottom of his document was a bunch of things that that council decided to spend money on. Things like, I mean, decided to allocate money for. Miscellaneous. Right? Miscellaneous things. Talking about a truck and all of this stuff. And when we're talking about our surplus of, you know, about 200000 or whatever, that, that includes that money that was budgeted for those items? And yes. Spent. And yes. not spent. Okay. And one of the grants Yeah. That's that's yeah. where you have the, the budget for the, the, the grant and you have the funding for the comprehensive plan. You have and you have some funding. No, it was like for emergency sirens. Emergency for, for well, um the, the original the, the emergency the emergency fund didn't go through because it was too much money, but Paul Sharp was there, and that was probably the biggest chunk of that expenses. I don't remember all of them, but um, you know, the we have to. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna. Have to be, uh, so it's you know it's incumbent on uh, this is it's going to be different this year um, because I'm the acting city manager and the and the budget guy um, and and so we are going to put together a a real logical um, budget that um, that shows that we are trying to save our city money um, we will save the city money um, but we do have to put numbers in all now I I I have been on calls with um, Attain LLC, which is our bookkeeping accounting firm, 
Um, there are some things that that they would like to recommend, you know, that would make this easier, not not more expensive, just just easier. Like for instance, um, they they can plug our budget figures into QuickBooks. Mm -hmm. um, and so and so what happens is you know the the real money so what's going on what's going on here this is cash you know this is this is cash base you know so money comes in it's entered money goes out it's entered so this is all snapshot i mean it's all you know this is a, a snapshot in time um but if the budget is entered into quickbooks we can do a budget versus actual report at any time um, and see exactly where we are against any one of these account lines. Um, and and I just said, well, we don't do that. He said, no, Brendan, Brendan like to get it and, and and plug it in, which is fine. I mean, it's, if you if you like working at spreadsheets, I mean that it, it works too. But if you've got the software that you're already paying for to make it happen, we would have to we would have to pay a pain a little bit more to enter those items, you know, correctly the budget items. Correctly in the QuickBooks. So why would you do that? It has to eliminate error and potential accidental overspending because you have this real time consistent reflection of what's going on versus, I mean, because it's just mm -hmm. easy to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's true. It is. Human, human, human it human. is. And, and it's like, and I mean, the way this is, the way this is set up, and I've gone through all of it, it, it really is pretty good. I mean, you can see it. It's you know you can get the subtotals on you know the taxes and get subtotals on on supplies or whatever and it's broken down pretty nicely that way. Um, so you can and, and you can roll that up if you want to and just sort of get you know top level stuff. But it's just like I I, I want to make this easier on us and for staff and and certainly for the council to understand exactly where you are um, because y'all are making the decisions to either spend or bring in. Um, money to the city, um, and we all have a fiduciary responsibility as citizens and as representatives of citizens to mm -hmm. manage this money well. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I I don't want to. I mean, I, I one of my one of my big concerns was that over a five year period we doubled our budget. You know, we doubled our expenses, and you know, there's just we didn't double in size. We didn't double in population. We didn't double in anything else, but we we doubled um, that. And I would I think we can take some some cost cutting measures, you know, bring some of those numbers down, still be able to provide more services um, that the that the city wants, um, just in a, in a more fiduciary, really responsible way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at calendar lines. Yes, I'm pulling yes. up for Wednesday, June 8th. So, this is the first meeting in July, and I believe this discussion uh, would constitute a workshop. Now, we received a certified estimate. We don't have it yet. We don't so, at the yet. end of the month. Um, I think there was. Uh, have we. Um, we have some items that. We council members feel should be funded. So we can discuss those on our second meeting in July. Okay, so um so my my thought on that is that is that I would I would like to set up a meeting on maybe the twenty fifth or twenty sixth of July for the budget workshop, um, depending on people's schedule. Just do just be able, just you can check your calendars while I'm talking. Um but 26, 26, 26, 26. Mm -hmm. right, 27 is my workshop. Yeah, that's why I said the 25th or the 26th. I know the conference plan meets in the morning. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, if you want me here, no. I'm no, 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 no. Then, I mean, I would look at the 25th, which is Monday. So we would do it, if you do the 26th, we would do it the afternoon. Right. right. 25th in the afternoon. 25th, the Monday? Monday, the 25th in the afternoon. Okay. Um, would be my preference, um, and hopefully we'll have um, the report from the appraisal office. Now, the, the way it works is we, we actually have to um, do the budget first, then do the, the tax rate, and come back to the budget again. It's a it's really convoluted, but that's the way it's done. Um, 
at the time. But we do have to but we do have to get some budget figures together. So I need for each of you to go back as liaison to your committee, make sure you've got every every duck and row as far as what you want them to do. I'm I'm a believer that you you set your goals, um, you look to fund those goals, um, and and that's what that's what creates the budget. If if those goals are set too high, or if it just, or if we need to make adjustments, we make those adjustments. That we basically have teams that want to bring things to the city, you know, and they cost money, or they bring money in. Not so much the, the latter, but um, but you know, we need to know what those are. I mean, we need to know, you know, where that where that guy is, you know, so we can start shooting for it. Um, and then if we have to make adjustments, we do. But we, we kind of know how much money will come in. That's not going to change a whole lot. You know, it, it doesn't tend to. Um, so we find additional amount of Well, yeah, well, grants, I mean, we're, we, I mean, we're very active um, looking for grants, which is, which is big. Um, but grants are, uh, yeah, we can't have are wishes. You know, yeah, like, we don't, we don't have the 200,000 plus of the OSAC grant in here. We only have yeah. the matching fund. So if you have a grant that looks positive, we need to include the matching fund under the miscellaneous column and hope for the you know that we get to spend it. Right. So so we can we can anticipate income from grants. Okay. We can budget for the matching component. Um, but we have to get a, a good handle on what these expenses are going to be and start getting them on paper. Um, Preferably before we sit down in a budget workshop, but I would like to be in a budget workshop actually going over these numbers and saying what we're listening to. Council Member Hunter. Yeah, uh, so I had a question it's about the budget and specifically the, the tax information coming through the county. Uh, shortly before Jacob's accident, uh, I was in here and we were working on the uh, credit, the homestead credit. 65 plus mm -hmm. and i know there was an email sent to notify officials that we had passed that um and so i'd like to what's the the current on that because it was, it was, okay and they got all that okay yeah. because i have been that won't be on, on it but. that won't be in next year's budget that's yeah. not going to be part of next year's avalon text it'll be in the next year but it yeah. has been approved okay. everything's good the appraiser has it okay mm -hmm. you know um, got back to us. It's 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 acknowledged and it will be on the vote. Okay. Okay. And then I'm sorry that I didn't do that. So if we have some, if we have, uh, for example, if we wanted to fund um, additional patrols, we would submit a request. If uh, okay, that was gonna say on the on the grants. That's what I uh, again. That's if if if. If, if it, but we have we're looking from the road replacement and road repairs. We're looking at when we will be bringing a financing plan for the next meeting in August. And where I see that getting the ability, where I see that getting grants would be is if we get the grant, then a what a tax note will go harder. Mm -hmm. We don't have the budget for the match for those. So that's that's what we need to to really, you know. I know it's very very competitive. I know that uh, there's no guarantee, but for, we need to. We can't sit here and say no. It's very competitive. No, there's no guarantee because there's so much money being made of it. Okay. And we on, don't, you know. I mean, and just to go on that concept is, um, I was in an industry where I often. Was applying for grants all the time, and what it is is we just kind of go, okay, I can get ten percent mm -hmm. of what I apply for, meaning ten percent of the different things I apply for. And so apply to hundred. You know, the more you apply, the more the better your chances are of getting something. And we are having a meeting on August second yes. um, with grant work to uh, and sort of mm -hmm. look at, at what because I don't think anybody here at the table. Um, wants to sit down and do a hundred grand application. No. Right. Well, we wouldn't. That we, 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 I don't. I don't want to speak. Maybe he is qualified. 
I have awarded grants, but apply for one as well as a Beganist of it. It's a very specific way of doing it. Right. Right. That's, very that's, specific. that's why the company is the best all in one. So, anyway, let's go ahead. I was just going to say that there's always a budget amendment, too. So, if we're shooting a shot and it's big, and we're not sure if we're getting all these things, we could put what we think in the budget, but also if we do get a grant, we can absolutely come back and amend it because we creature does have the liquidity and the funds to throw a little bit more money around in some ways, right. especially yeah. if, if we, it means free and money. If we, and if we, if we end this year, you know, in the in a positive way, um, like six figures in positive ways, you know, that goes back into the general fund. Um, and if a little extra money is needed to supplement a drainage project so that we can do a better road, you know, we can we can make that yes. we can make that happen. Yes. But we're not gonna spend money we don't have. And you know, and then there's also you're talking about the, the things that we haven't done and we'll talk about that. We're talking about the big, big grants, but there are smaller grants that are being awarded throughout the year. Here's the LCRA. They come back in December. Parts and wildlife. Every month there's something. There's things that we could be doing. But again, we need to it, it does help to have consultants that actually know that world. So. Yeah. Um, okay, okay, when we get back to this, are we good? Money, money, money. So the so, Monday the 20th, one or two, you mean? You mean the clock? Yeah, well, I was thinking like two o'clock. Huh? I was thinking like two o'clock. So, so, so the motion would be Monday, July 25th, 2 p.m. for everybody. 2 p.m. for have a budget workshop. Which is good. I can call as a special meeting. But, you know, I entertain the motion. Okay. I did that. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to put it in. Just, I, Looking at your schedule one more time here, Monday, July 25th is the date to receive the estimate from Hayes County on the tax rate. Right. So, that's good. so, they get your so it would be it would be helpful to have that, but it's not necessary okay. for us to do our budget. Work. Okay. 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 We have to have the budget before we can have a discussion about the tax rate okay. anyway. Okay. Um, but we do have to kind of, you know, basically look at okay. Well, if there's if there's no new revenue tax rate, and we we know what that is. You know, so we can start there and work from there. If we decide later on to set the tax rate differently, then we adjust the budget. Right. Right. But first you budget to what you think is going to be. Okay. So I have it down on So can everybody make the 25th? We're all good with that? Okay. So you made a motion. Is there a second for the we will miss you. Um, yeah. We'll just look everything. Okay. okay. And certainly with Jacob the next day. Um, but we do have to get this done. I mean, it's like there, there are deadlines that go with this that we have to meet. So, um, so, so. Was there a second to the yes, I think so. so we'll go ahead and go the time and of oh. course it's here. So the motion is to set a budget workshop for two o'clock on Monday the twenty fifth. Yeah. Yeah. I need to go ahead and get that posted. Yeah. Uh councilmember Deborah Hines. Hi. Councilmember Brent Foley. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aurora Lebrun. Aye. Councilmember Chris Drummer. Aye. Thank you. Um, the last item on the agenda is executive session to section 551.072 deliberation regarding real property. Um, and so it is 7:33, and we are in executive session. Thank y'all for being here. Do you want to talk tomorrow about the agenda? Yeah, we need to talk on the phone. Yeah, we can 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 talk on the phone.